Magistrates Court in KwaZulu Natal today on charges of drunken driving and reckless and negligent driving. In a statement, police say the man's vehicle collided with former President Jacob Zuma's official armored state vehicle. The identification process of the bodies of the 45 Botswana nationals who died in a bus crash last Thursday at the Mamatakala Bridge between Maken and Mukupan in Limpopo is expected to resume this morning. The bus fell off a 50 meter high bridge and caught fire. And the bail application of five suspects who are accused of the murders of Kinen, a.k.a. Forbes and Tibello Tips Motswane, resumes today before the Deben Magistrates Court. Last week, the matter took an unexpected turn when the court heard that the money allegedly used to pay the accused to kill Forbes and Motswane was allegedly from taxi boss in the province, Mfundo Kaba. I'll have details on this and other stories at 7. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. The business update on SAFM. Well, this morning, Jimmy Moyaha, our business show host, is with us. Jimmy, good morning. Welcome back to SAFM Sunrise. Morning, Stephen. Nice to be back. <laughs> um, uh, what's happening in our Asian and U.S. markets today? How are they looking so far this morning? Bit of a mixed bag, actually. Uh, we've got Tokyo down about a third of a percent. You've got Hong Kong up about 2.3 percent. Uh, Korean markets up about half a percent as well, uh, with mainland China uh, sitting flat at the moment. Uh, if we look at some of the other Asian markets, uh, markets in the Philippines up about 1.02 percent. And if you have a look at commodities, uh, the price of gold sitting at $2,252 an ounce, they're still maintaining those highs that we saw from the month uh, of March. Uh, conti- hopefully this momentum continues into the month of April, but the Brent crude price still worryingly uh, close to $90, sitting at $87.45 a barrel there. Uh, in early trade at the moment, platinum is showing uh, signs of green, sitting at $917 an ounce there. Uh, the rand sitting slightly uh, softer against the dollar at this stage at 18 rand and 93 cents. Uh, but if we look at some Asian currencies, the uh, Japanese yen also giving back about a quarter of a percent against the U.S. dollar at this stage. And Xiaomi adding almost $8 billion to its market cap in one day. Yes, uh, they finally came out with their electric vehicle range. So Xiaomi announced that they would be pursuing uh, this EV play in 2021 when their CEO said they'd be putting at least $10 billion into this. And in their pre-sales orders, they hit almost 90,000 units of uh, pre-sale orders. Uh, This despite the fact that Xiaomi expects to still lose on average around $10,000 per vehicle uh, at the current price that they've got it uh, in the market at, which is just under 30,000 US dollars, which surprisingly is cheaper than the Tesla Model 3 uh, in China in terms of costing. So uh, the Chinese population benefiting from those lower prices, but Xiaomi still expecting to make a loss on these vehicles. Hopefully they will see uh, some different pricing going forward and potentially uh, some other strategic advantages that will allow them to offset this. But this news and these developments uh, or the launch, rather, of this EV, allowing them to uh, see a share price surge of around 16% uh, in today's trade. And that's what's fueled uh, the $7.6 billion, rand, billion dollar market cap increase in the stock. Jimmy Moyaha, business show uh, thank you, host. Thank you very much indeed. More from him in an hour. More from him this evening as well here on SAFM. 26 minutes now to 9 to 7 o'clock. Africa Update on SAFM Sunrise, a continental overview of current African affairs. Russ Advocate Sipo Mantula, good morning. How are you doing? Sipo, we're fresh in Munyan Jambo, Africa. And welcome, Jimmy, to the radio news season and the freedom man. Indeed. The president of Nigeria and the president of ECOWAS, Bola Tanibul, he's going to Dakar and Senegal. What's happening? Stephen, today it is the inauguration of the Senegal president-elect Basir Diomaye Faye. Now, you remember that Bola Tinubu chairing the ECOWAS, it is important for him to be there, but it appears that after the uh, end of the inauguration, he will return to the capital city, Abuja. Uh, it is expected even some of the religious, I mean, uh, regional leaders of ECOWAS, Stephen, not even religious, only regional leaders. I don't know from South Africa who they will be sending, but this is a very important inauguration that is happening in Senegal, Dakar, uh, this morning where we see a young 44 year, year old man taking over 
uh, from Matisali and also defeating the former Prime Minister Amudu Ba, who I expect him to attend. Usman Sonko Steven, I expect him to be there. And I know SABC coverage from Meso Fumikoena, they will be uh, marshalling that coverage of that inauguration. And then in the DRC, the President Felix Tshisekedi appointing their first ever female Prime Minister. This woman Stephen was in the cabinet before. He was in the planning uh, commission, planning minister. This is Judith Sumino, who's now taking the role from the uh, former prime minister, Jean Michael Sama Lukunde. Now, what Sister Kate is moving, Stephen, is that there's a coalition of parties. They've been delayed who can appoint the prime minister. Now, they've taken... Uh, this uh, move by uh, appointing this first ever female prime minister, who some of his tasks is to work on peace development of the country. That's what he said yesterday. Uh, one of the issues is uh, employment for the youth, uh, social cohesion within the 100 people, 100 million people of DRC that he has to deal with, and the conflict uh, in the eastern part of DRC will also be some of his challenges. As, a, as the first female ever prime minister, Stephen, because women are also affected by conflict in the eastern part of the DRC. And then in Mali, political parties there, they're requesting time frames for the presidential elections. Stephen, they're worried that it's almost 24 months since 2021 coup, then March 2024, where there was a promise to restore civilian rule. They're challenging Asim Goyit now, saying that it's time up now. Why are you not calling for the elections? And they're saying they will use all legal and legitimate avenues for the return of normal constitutional order in that country. Uh, the military junta has not yet come out clear, Stephen, after this uh, move that has come out over this weekend in Bamako, where 20 opposition parties, Stephen, they are worried about the electoral calendar in their country. And then in Rwanda, the, Kiga- the Liberal Party and the Social Democratic Party both endorsing the candidate of the Rwanda Patriotic Front. And who is the leader, Stephen- the candidate for that? <laughs> Stephen, there is the presidential and parliamentary polls in Chigali in Rwanda on the 15th of July this year. What is important is that the two parties that we have mentioned are what you call the oldest political parties in East Africa nation. Now they have joined the four smaller political parties who have already endorsed uh, the ruling coalition of um, Rwanda, the RPF that is led by Paul Gagame. Uh, the Foreign Affairs Minister Vincent Birut Stephen saying that this endorsement is, is a showing of confidence in Paul Gagame, age 66 who have been the president. He won the president elections uh, since 2003, 2010, 2017, with more than 90%. Others are still worried, Stephen, but uh, you will watch and see what will happen in Chigali come July 15. And then in our archive, you're taking us all the way back to the 2nd of April, 1904. It's still 100, it's almost 120 years ago, Stephen. Very important in the politics of the ICJ and Germany and Namibia, what they've been talking on this day. The German forces were defeated by the Herero people in Namibia. That marks also the end of the colonial rule of Germans, despite that there have been conflicts uh, between Germany and Namibia. But the Herero people became victorious on this day as G. Asante Sana, as you are in the conversation, SAFM observing the, women, the Freedom Month, Stephen, not the Human Rights Month, the Freedom Month, as you are entering the 30 year long of the celebration of the freedom and democracy in South Africa. The Rust Advocate Sipo Mantula, thank you very much indeed. More news, of course, from our continent through the day here on SAFM. Call us on 086 000 2032. 21 minutes to 7. You know the number, of course, 086 000 2032. Lots going on already, even though it's going to be another sort of short week. Uh, if you look at the stuff that's going on at the moment, you can just see that uh, there's so many different issues. And, of course, it is election season. Voice notes coming through this morning on 0614-104-107. Good morning, good morning, good morning, SG. My name is Joseph. I just wanted to get this uh, quick clarity here regarding our former state president, uh, Jacob Zuma. Uh, he is still on uh, his benefits uh, as you know the former state president. Now his intention is to be back in parliament again, and we know that all parliamentarians they do get you know these uh, other benefits. So now what will happen to now the benefits of um, that he is supposed to get them in parliament vis-a-vis the benefits that he is getting as the former state president? How will uh, it be arranged? Uh, is he going to forfeit uh, one of the benefits? or he's going to get both. I need clarity on that one. My name is Joseph. Thank you. Joseph, a very interesting question. Bye-bye. Thank you. I, I, had, I have no idea how all of that works. I don't know if it's ever happened before. And that's one of the confusing things. Errol in Durban. Hi, former President Jacob Zuma. What do you think is going to happen, Daryl? Errol? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Errol. 
Uh, you know, before I start, I wanted to ask you last week, uh, what, what would America do now that they've taken a new stance? Would they still supply arms and ammunition? Well, cle- clearly they are, anyway, yes. <laughs> yeah, anyway, with Jacob Zuma, I doubt that he'll appeal. Because, I mean, this guy's lost too many court cases and uh, mm. it must be costing him a fortune in legal fees. And uh, I heard that he still owes some of his team a lot of legal fees. So, look, I could be wrong, but I doubt that he'll appeal. Yeah. Well, let's see, uh, Errol. Um, I think there's politics to it. We'll ask MK in a little while and just find out from them exactly what's going to happen and how that plays out. 19 minutes to 7. At SFM Radio and at Stephen Grutus on Twitter. Well, amid fears that we might have a much smaller maize crop this year because of the hot, dry weather due to the El Nino phenomenon, there's still a lot of evidence of the impact high food prices are having as years. You know, food prices, food price inflation shot up sort of two and a half years ago. It's been pretty high since then. Mark Wagerov is a senior lecturer and development studies co- program coordinator at the University of Pretoria. He's also at the Center of Excellence in Food Security. Mark, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. If you look at the latest figures, I mean, to try and feed a family good, wholesome, nutritious food, is it getting any easier? It's obviously still very, very difficult. Well, I think what's happening, and we can see in February and March, which is a positive, is that the food price increases are stabilizing to some extent. And especially we can see the gap between core inflation and food inflation has decreased. So... For more than four years, every month, food has increased um, substantially more than core inflation. <clears throat> Sorry, but that's just stabilizing at this point. The problem is it's stabilizing at a very high level. So, you know, after years of food, you know, high food price increases, the damage has been done. And <clears throat> I mean, if we look, for example, at the most recent report that came out in February from Human Sciences Research Council, um, we, yeah, this is the most comprehensive national survey looking at food security um, since COVID. And that showed substantial increases in food insecurity and stunting among children. So we're seeing, according to that report, about 63.5% of households experiencing some level of food insecurity. And that's up from sort of 45 to 50% estimated before COVID. And stunting of children is now at about 28.8%, according to that report. So that's a massive increase from around 24% um, before COVID. So the damage has been done. The stabilization is good, but it's not yet addressing the problem because essentially real incomes have not increased, but food prices have increased. So the stabilization is welcome, but we need to do far more to you know, ensure that 60, you know, less than 63% of our people, close to two-thirds of our people, are not able to get adequate food. Sure. Mark, uh, if you need to cough yeah. or something, I'll switch you off for a moment because I can hear that maybe you need to still quite early in the morning. I just want to, you, you say 63% of people don't have enough food, and that's an incredible figure. There was, I know we, we went through a period from 1994 onwards of making a lot of progress against the stunting of children. It seemed that the percentage of children that were stunted was slowly coming down, it took a long time. Has it now gone back, back, back to where it was? I mean, all of that progress has basically been wiped out because of COVID. Well, we had serious progress post-apartheid, really up to 2007, 2008, and then it was flatlined, and then COVID has made it substantially worse. So we would stopped making progress for the last 15, 16 years, uh, and now things have got worse. And of course, it's COVID, but then the economic crisis that the country is in. And you know, unfortunately, the poorest have been hardest hit as they spend more of their income on food. So... Um, you know, and as I said, for four years now, food prices have increased substantially above the core inflation. So if we look at the Peter Maritzburg economic justice and dignity figures, you know, they show that year on year in March now, the increase in the basket for the average family is 6.3%. So as I said, stabilizing. But last year, it was 10, 11.6% increase. The year before, 10.2% increase. So, you know, if we just look at onions, for example, to make it very concrete, they're showing that onions were down year on year by 25%. But the previous year, they were up 67%. So it's like a little bit of the damage has been rectified, but not enough. And too many people remain in serious poverty. And I'm glad you mentioned the El Nino effect, because I think we're going to see worse to come. The impact mm-hmm. of, you know, of the weather on something like maize, we're beginning to see it on the farm. We're going to see that coming through the system onto the shelves in the coming months. And unfortunately, the state is not doing enough to address that real challenge. And 
you know, the biggest intervention the state is making to keep people away from hunger is the grant system. But the state is systematically reducing the real value of the grant. So if we look at this year, the budget speech, they will tell us, oh, we're increasing the pension by 100 rand. They don't tell you <laughs> that adjustment mm-hmm. is 4.8% against an inflation, food inflation of 6.1%. So every year, the buying power of someone relying on a state grant or pension, a child grant, has been systematically reduced. They, can't, they simply cannot buy the same amount of food they could buy before. And that's a continuing trend that really the government should be challenged on. Um, we have huge regional variations. Is what's happening in rural areas uh, different to urban areas at the moment? Well, I think some, there's signs, and if you look at the HSRC report I mentioned, which is the National um, Survey of Food and Nutrition Security, we see that in some areas, for example, of Limpopo, where people do have more access to agricultural land, they're faring somewhat better in areas of stunting and food insecurity. So where people have some access to land, they're able to subsidize low incomes with a little bit of their own production. But of course, we know we're now a majority urbanized society. So most people can't do that. Um, And so we're seeing increasing numbers of people in urban areas who are food insecure. So while levels of food insecurity can be higher in some rural areas, the overall number of people food insecure are actually now sitting in urban areas. So therefore, we have to look at things like the function of food markets. We have to make sure food markets are functioning for the poorest and not just um, for profits for some of the larger food groups and supermarkets. Mark Wagera, thanks very much indeed. Really appreciate it. Senior lecturer in developmental studies at the University of Pretoria, also a member of the DSI NRF Centre of Excellence in Food Security. There's so much more to talk about there with so many people just not having enough food and so many children not getting enough food as well. We'll plan more conversations for you around that. 13 minutes now to 7. SAFM guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Pretty busy Tuesday now in terms of uh, volumes. If you look at the N1, that's a good barometer for how much is going on. Coming out of Pretoria down to uh, Joburg, traffic just sitting from sort of John Foster territory uh, through Brockfontein and all the way down to uh, New Road. So uh, Route 1 probably a little bit busy than you might be thinking. Uh, also the roadworks on the R21 south approaching Clayville, uh, that is already queuing. It's a um, heavier queue than normal for this time of morning. So uh, just a reminder, if you're leaving Pretoria, you've got flights to connect with at the airport and you're driving at morning or afternoon peak times uh, do allow extra time to uh, to get through and to get to your arrival time and your flight connection on time. Uh, we even saw during yesterday's public holiday Monday uh, yesterday afternoon that was backlogging so just an indication of um, how severe those uh, delays get. Uh, the Mike 1 pretty heavy as well from Boysons all the way through to Empire Road and of course the N3 queuing up through Bedford View into the uh, left lane closure that's been there forever at Van Buren Road. Uh, Durban's N2 just starting its uh, daily sort of grind up between the M7 and Westwood Mall that's as you hit the uh, roadwork section just north of Spaghetti Junction. Uh, Peter Brownsburg to Durban looks clear, no problems through the uh, many uh, sort of roadwork sections there between Ashburton and Cato Ridge. And Cape Town, a major delay, it's probably the biggest delay across the country this morning on the N2 inbound. Uh, there's a crash before the R300 in front of Kyalicha. Traffic's parking back almost towards uh, Baden Powell Drive. That's around a 30 minute delay to get through. Uh, the rest of the highways, the N1 inbound from Platycliffe Hill to Kuburg Interchange is busy, and the M5 is uh, slowing up uh, between Kenilworth and the N1 Cuba get a change. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. Call us on 86 Eleven minutes to seven. Khotso and Malutia Pafong. Khotso, hi. Uh, former President Zuma in this car accident. Go for it. Uh, very well, Khotso. Go for it, yeah. Man, Stephen, do you still remember one of the day I said to you the formation of the MK political party is just to protect the Zuma family? Do you still remember that statement? Yes, I think, that I, think I, made? I do remember you saying that, yeah. Uh, okay, right. Stephen, man, uh, uh, the spokesperson of the MK political party is saying the accident that involved President uh, Jacob Zuma, it was uh, orchestrated or, or it was a plan. Mm. Uh, to plot Zuma, to kill Zuma. Can he, he, he disclose uh, uh, the information? Mm. I, I, I think it's a very interesting uh, statement that they yeah. issued. Yeah, Khotso, no, I mean, I saw that. Now, uh, I'll ask him. We'll speak to him in about uh, 15 minutes from now. Uh, so I'll ask him, and let's see if there is any evidence. I, I do think, you know, and you know me, Khotso, if you're going to make claims, you need to bring evidence. Um, and so we'll ask him what the evidence of that claim is. 
Thank you, Stephen. What's up? Thank you. Kia bonga from Malutia Pofong. It's 10 minutes now to 7. SAFM values your views. Be an active citizen. Well, now, formal legal confirmation in the Government Gazette that the highways in Gauteng will no longer legally be tolled from midnight on the 11th of April. In other words, nine days from now, the e-toll gantries will be legally useless. But there's still questions around how Teng's going to pay the portion that was agreed to pay under that deal with the national government. The national government, you may remember, instituted e-tolling. There were huge objections from civil society, from Kasatu, the Gauteng ANC. And if you look at the evidence, I think most people in Gauteng, or the Premier of Gauteng now, is Pinyaza Lesufi. Mr. Premier, good morning. Hey, good morning, Steve. How are you? I'm How well. You? My I'm well. voice, Steve. It's early in the morning. It's all right. Everybody this morning, I think, is battling with the same thing. It'll get better as we go through the day. Firstly, you must be pleased that finally these e-tolls are going. I mean, it's been a long fight. Finally, they're gone. Indeed. Um, it, it, it was a credibility test, Steve. Uh, we've made this announcement, I think, in the last two State of the Province addresses, and people felt that we were misleading them. So... For us to push to ensure that this gazette debt and to ensure that finally they are switched off is indeed a fulfilling moment. Was it a big fight with national government to get this through the gazette? Massive, massive fight. Um, it, it, it was indeed at one stage I felt that uh, we managed to pull out all the negotiations. Uh, it was difficult, uh, uphill, harsh, uncompromising. Uh, but we, we were firm uh, in our resolve that this matter needs to be finalized as quickly as possible so that we don't have this um, challenge going forward because uh, it's affecting the development of our roads in, in, in Gauteng. I mean, if you check our highways, especially the e tolled roads, uh, they were like a parking bay in the morning and in the afternoon because we couldn't do anything. We couldn't expand them. Uh, we couldn't maintain them. And uh, we couldn't also... Uh, provide the necessary support to alternative roads. So it was very, very important that we resolve the matter. And indeed, we are, we are thrilled and excited that finally uh, this matter is now over. Why did national government push so hard against you? I mean, why did they, you know, just refuse to accept that the people of Gauteng, it was clear, were never going to pay? Well, there was a debt that needed to be paid. Uh, I think they also needed to protect the integrity of the loan market uh, and the bond market. Uh, they also have to ensure that those that normally assist them, because it's not the only area where we request funding. I mean, we've got the whole train uh, that needs to be expanded. We've got highways and many other institutions where we rely on borrowing. So you need to protect that because if you don't, people will say, we borrow you money and then you later come and say you can't pay and that will harm the integrity of uh, of our country. But on this one, uh, we made an upfront commitment. Uh, the only uh, uh, difficult part was that after we've made that commitment that we'll pay 30% of this fees uh, or of this loan, uh, we thought that that commitment will be taken as a, a genuine commitment from another sphere of government, uh, but we're then compelled to say, don't just say, hey, you'll pay 30%, show us the money. Uh, and we have to scramble uh, to go and look for that particular money because we wanted to shield uh, our uh, social services, especially education, health, and social development. Because if we just say, okay, uh, take the 12 billion from our budget, we are going to be catastrophic. So. We had then to start to scramble, identify financial institutions that are willing to work with us. And that took long. Uh, and that's the reason why finally we have this decision now. Okay. What happens to the roads now? Those highways, do you have to maintain them or does Sanral maintain them? Well, it's a balance that we needed to strike, uh, a compromise that we needed to strike. Because our argument was that, yes, the roads might be in Houghton, but they're not used by Houghton citizens alone. And therefore, to expect Houghton citizens alone to maintain them, uh, it will be wrong. Uh, but with a compromise of 30% and the roads are here, are mainly utilized by people for Houghton, we felt that the 30% no, sure, 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 sure. Sorry, I'm asking a slightly different... And the maintenance. Different... Yeah, yeah, the maintenance, maintenance as well. Mm. Yeah, uh, that because... That was another sticking point uh, before we could sign. Uh, they wanted us to see whether we have budgeted for maintenance of this particular road. And fortunately, during our budget, as if we're expecting this call, we, we budgeted for some amount of money. And then we made a commitment that we'll budget almost $4 billion, uh, for the maintenance of this particular road. Yes, the maintenance will be done by 
the Gauteng provincial government. So you can give me an assurance now that those roads will not look like the rest of the roads in Gauteng in a few years' time? Definitely, and that's that's our main reason why we wanted uh, the e-toll part to be removed, because we couldn't maintain them. Uh, uh, as I said earlier on, there was just nothing else but uh, parking bay in the morning and the afternoon. So now that we have committed to maintain Obviously, there will be some support that will be given to us because there's a huge stretch of roads. Uh, but where we stand as housing is that we will maintain them and ensure that uh, they remain better and better. But we need to expand as well because the e was the first phase. There are two remaining phases. There's mm. phase two and phase three. So we couldn't start planning for phase two and phase three because roads are the backbone of any economic development and housing. You need to expand our roads to link us, for example. Rustenberg is coming very strong towards Houting. Limpopo is coming very strong towards Houting. Uh, Free State, especially a social bag, Harry Smith areas, are coming closer and closer to Houting. So we need to plan to ensure that we expand those particular roads and take advantage of those expansions for economic benefits of citizens of Houting. And now that this matter has been resolved, we are quite excited that at least there will be some developments in this regard uh, still. Mr. Premier, the, the story of e I suppose, is really a story of a national government that didn't properly consult people, used the wrong system. You're a part of the Gauteng ANC, you're the Premier now, and the Gauteng ANC opposed e for a long time. I thought the Gauteng ANC was a little bit quiet. You know, you had Gauteng Kasatu leading marches all the time. And then kind of 2014, 2015, you got a bit louder. And I remember David Makura, he was the provincial uh, secretary at the time. And then the premier, and he got very vocal. And then in the state of the province address, he basically came clean and said, look, we oppose this. And I wonder, I mean, there are lots of lessons here. Do you think the national ANC has learned a lesson about consultation? Well, the opposite is true that uh, indeed the ANC government is becoming a listening government and there was no need for us to just bash, bash, bash when the, the ministry indicated in the budget speech almost three years ago that it also will be history. Uh, we took advantage of that announcement and worked extremely hard in establishing necessary committees, going to a brief cabinet, Cabinet established a subcommittee at one stage that uh, the former minister Tito Mboweni in there. So we took advantage when uh, uh, there was that announcement. But you know, uh, we took a, a huge backlash, uh, Steve uh, when I was the deputy chair of the ANC in this province, when we led a march uh, as the ANC and people accused us, you are marching against yourself. Uh, when we could just send a memorandum to the ANC. So we had to learn from that as well, uh, that people were not comfortable, that we were active and we, we took this matter to the street. And uh, uh, when we made an analysis, uh, it was not a favorable outcome when ordinary South Africans said that you can't match against yourself. So we didn't keep quiet for the sake of keeping quiet, but we took advantage of feedbacks. But most more importantly, uh, we, I just felt that government was a listening government. They just accepted that these things are not working. It's just that the modalities were very difficult. As I said, the negotiations were extremely, extremely difficult, uh, very robust. Uh, but uh, now it also, uh, our history, we're quite excited, but uh, the hard work starts now. Um, I, I know, you know, some car rental companies, some other companies, uh, government departments, they all had e-tags. I don't know if the cars that transport you have e-tags, Mr. Premier, but no one's going to get paid back, are they? So once bit in twice, uh, 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 Steve, you, you, we can't make that announcement now. Now that the e will be uh, decasseted, if I have to use that word, we have to start the consultation process with the stakeholders themselves to say that, that those that didn't pay, that those that have paid, how do we resolve the quagmire? So we need to consult, uh, and out of that consultation, hopefully, a resolution will be found. But we've been approached by the trucking industry who said that, please, regardless of what you are doing, don't switch them off in terms of trucking their vehicles that are going through under these countries. They assist us to estimate time sure. of delivery, they assist us on many other things, whether the car has been ejected or not. So we are also going to consult on the remodeling of the country 
so that they are better utilized and not just a white elephant standing on our roads. Mr. Premier, I appreciate the time. Thank you very much indeed. Panyaza Lesufi, the Premier of Gauteng. In a few moments, you'll hear from the political party Umkuntu Wissizwe. Are they going to appeal that decision to uphold the objection? And who lodged it against former President Jacob Zuma as a candidate uh, for the party in Parliament? Also, Dr. Lumkile Mondi on electricity tariffs. They went up yesterday. You're with SFM leading the conversation. Good morning, 7 o'clock. Thank you, Stephen. In your top stories, a man accused of crashing into Zuma's vehicle to appear in court and the National Taxi Alliance not decided on fare hikes amid rising fuel costs. This is SAFM News. A very good morning. I am Luanda Maume. A 51-year-old man is expected to appear before the SOA Magistrates Court in Guazulu Natal today on charges of drug and driving and reckless and negligent driving. In a statement, police say the man's vehicle collided with former President Jacob Zuma's office Ahmad State Vehicle. The incident happened on Thursday night on the R66 when Zuma was believed to be travelling between Gandla and Eshowe. Police have confirmed that at the time of the collision, Zuma was in the vehicle with his protectors. No one was injured in the crash. The identification process of the bodies of the 45 Botswana nationals who died in a bus crash last Thursday at the Mamatlakala Bridge between Maken and Mukupan in Limpopo is expected to resume this morning. The bus fell off a 50-meter high bridge and caught fire. It was traveling from Khaboroni in Botswana to the St. Engenas ZCC in Moria for the Easter Church service. Pimani Baloi reports. Limpopo Health MEC Dr. Popi Ramatuba says nine of the bodies were recovered from the scene in a state where they could be identifiable. The remainder of the bodies were charred to ashes and will only be identified through DNA tests. The process of sampling DNA from the relatives of the deceased is already underway in Botswana. Health Minister Dr. Joe Padla is this morning expected to visit the Mamatlagala Bridge. He is also expected to visit the 80-year-old girl who is the sole survivor of the crash at the Mukopani Hospital. Meanwhile, Botswana nationals making their way back home to Botswana at the Khroblas Bridge border post in Limpopo say they are devast- devastated by the bus crash that killed 45 of their compatriots. An eight-year-old girl was the sole survivor of the crash. These Botswana nationals say they are still shocked by the incident. Yeah, it was it was a shock. Uh, we are we are mourning in Botswana. It was a very very bad incident. Unfortunately, but yeah, there's nothing we can do. Uh, everything is in God's hand. I think it was God's will. We are shocked and we are sad. Yeah, because some of them are our relatives, a relative friend. From the bail application of five suspects who are accused of the murder of Kinen, a.k.a. Forbes, and Tibel Lotibs Mutsuane resumes today before the Deben Magistrates Court. Last week, the matter took an unexpected twist when the court heard that the money allegedly used to pay the accused to kill Forbes and Mutsuane was allegedly from a taxi boss in the province, Mfundo Taba, a.k.a. and Mutsuane were gunned down in Deben last year. Nonjabulo Mdunga Magamu reports. In a sworn statement that was read out in court last week, investigating officer Detective Bob Pillay indicated that 800,000 rand was transferred from Bright Circle, a company belonging to a Mfondo Kaba, to Mzwe Temba Kwabeni. Kwabeni is believed to be the coordinator of the hit. Pillay said the payment was made shortly after Kwabeni called Kaba the day after the murders. The Kaba family has since issued a statement citing that Kaba has not yet been approached by the police on this matter. Last week, the court also heard that several of the accused are linked to taxi violence in other pending cases. The National Taxi Alliance says it hasn't decided on whether they will increase commuter fares following yet another fuel price hike from midnight tonight. The Mineral Resources and Energy Department says petrol will increase by 65 cents a litre for 93 unleaded and 67 cents for 95 unleaded. The price of diesel will increase by around 3 cents a litre. NTA spokesperson is Theo Malele. We're pretty aware of uh, the ensuing uh, price increase. 
but uh, there hasn't been uh, meaningful engagement from taxi operators for us to be in a position to can uh, say what the sense is within uh, the, the industry. Safe to say that uh, we have to wait for uh, guys to fully engage on this aspect, and only then can we, uh, you know, come out and do any, you know, pronouncement uh, to that effect. And finally, Iran has warned of a harsh response to a suspected Israeli airstrike on its embassy in Syria, which is reported to have killed 11 people. Two senior commanders of the Revolutionary Guard were among the dead. The BBC's Sebastian Asher reports. Among those killed was Mohammad Reza Zahedi, who once headed Iran's elite Quds force in both Syria and Lebanon. There's been no comment from Israel, which has been hitting Iranian-linked targets in Syria for years, but rarely, if ever, officially confirms its operations. There's no doubt that this is a serious escalation in the long-running confrontation between Israel and Iran, which has sharpened dangerously since war erupted between Israel and Hamas. Iran will have to calibrate its response carefully as it strives to pursue its battle with Israel through its regional proxies such as Hezbollah without shifting into direct conflict. Recapping your top story, a 51-year-old man whose vehicle allegedly crashed into former President Jacob Zuma's official Ahmad State vehicle is expected to appear before the Eshoe Magistrates Court in KZN on charges of drunken driving and reckless and negligent, negligent driving. For SAFM News, I am Luanda Maume. Headlines at 7.30. A very good morning to you in your SFM Sunrise Sport. Cricket South Africa is celebrating the rise of women's cricket with national contracts for emerging stars. And in tennis action, Dominic Team makes a winning comeback on the ATP Tour. Catch the full stories just before 7.30. SAFM Sunrise Guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Uh, Jobo Gen 3, even heavier now on the run from Germiston and coming out of Alberton off the N12 all the way through to Galoolies. You've got the left lane closure because of uh, roadworks at Van Buren. That's been there forever. Uh, but now a breakdown blocking the right lane between Van Buren and Galoolies. So very heavy uh, traffic backlogging through the Ilans interchange. Uh, the N1 North Malabongwe through to Ravonia Road looking a little bit slower than you'd like. A little bit slower than normal on that section. And the R21 queuing if you're on your way to the airport having left Pretoria. Uh, into the roadworks and lane restrictions at Clayville. Make sure you've got extra time uh, to get through that. There is a breakdown near Linwood Road to the N1 South coming through from the N4, uh, starting to backlog as well. Durban's N2 queuing up from the M7. That's the uh, bluff exit all the way through to Westwood Mall through uh, the roadworks just north of Spaghetti Junction. And Cape Town, good news, the N2 inbound crash at Kyalicha uh, by the R300 is clear. The bad news is that traffic remains heavy. There's uh, pressure from Baden Powell Drive all the way passing Kyalicha right towards the R300. And the M5 works the mention as well. It's pretty heavily backed up this Tuesday as you sit from the Ottery area all the way through to the N1 Kubo get a change. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. SAFM Sunrise. A vivid start to your day. Eight after seven. Good morning. You're with SFM, SFM Sunrise. I'm Stephen Curtis. All right. In a moment, you'll hear from the political party. I'm Kunto Wissiz. We'll ask questions around that accident. Also ask uh, around the Electoral Commission's decision to uphold that objection against former President Jacob Zuma as a candidate. Uh, that doesn't mean that he can't be the face on the ballot box, but on the ballot paper, by the way, although I think it's more of a sort of logo that you'll see there. Um, also, coming up from 8.30, it's been interesting to look at the numbers as to how the illicit tobacco industry has just grown and grown and grown and particularly since the lockdown you know it's just huge anyway we'll find out more about that important conversations to come there we'll continue to take your calls as well on 086 you heard that conversation around etels also food prices and the impact the huge impact that food prices are having on people actually very very scary all of that to come nine after seven Unforgettable happens when the young and the old know they can surf, snorkel, fish, enjoy whale watching, and end the day with sundowners near Shisanyama. KwaZulu Natal is a jaw waiting to happen. Ziakipa. With hiking, horse riding, biking, zip lining, and mountain biking adventures, waiting for the fearless and the bold. Unforgettable happens here. Zwagala. Brought to you by Tourism KwaZulu Natal. 
Are you a small business or cooperative looking for a business loan under a million rand? SIFA can assist through the Township and Rural Entrepreneurship Program. TREP provides blended finance to various sectors facilitating participation in the economy. SIFA services are free and don't make use of private consultants. Visit sifa.org.za. SIFA is a registered credit provider. Terms and conditions apply. The Mars Singer South Africa is coming to a mall near you. Join in on the fun from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. at Maponya Mall from the 21st to the 24th of March. Centurion Mall from the 28th to the 31st of March. Blue Route Mall Cape Town from the 4th to the 7th of April. Meet the Masks, win awesome prizes. Channel, channel your inner megastar with Season 2 of The Mars Singer South Africa only on S3. Open up. Stephen Kruatis on SAFM. 10 after 7. Good morning. Well, I'm expecting developments today. I think there will be developments today, I should say, around former President Jacob Zuma and the political party Mkonto Wissizwe. Today is the deadline for people to lodge applications against objections against them at the Electoral Court. On Thursday, the Electoral Commission said it had upheld an objection. It might have been objections against Zuma as a candidate for MK on its list of people to go to Parliament. As I understand the law, this does not mean he can't be on the ballot, just that he can't go to Parliament. At the same time, a small accident over the weekend involving Zuma's convoy, a drunk driver arrested immediately afterwards due to appear in court today. Well, let's hear now from the political party, Um Umkonto Wissizwe, and uh, just hear their view on all of this. And Tlamulo Ntlela is the spokesperson for MK. And Tlamulo, good morning. Thanks for your time. Good morning, Stephen, and good morning to your listeners. Firstly, are you going to appeal the decision of the Electoral Commission against former President Zuma at the Electoral Court, or have you maybe done it already? Um, indeed, Stephen, we are going to be appealing it. Um, our attorneys are looking at it, and they've been looking at it, and uh, you know they'll, they've been looking at the merits effectively, and they will then uh, you know, submit an appeal accordingly. But I think also what's important, Stephen, uh, that we should... Uh, inform our listeners and South Africans is that uh, Mkonto is Caesar as a party, as you would know, through the court process that we won um, in the electoral court, is going to be on the ballot paper. That's one thing that ought to be clear, because there's a notion that President Zuma's face, or that a leader's face, ought to be in the ballot. And I think that's a wrong uh, view of it. It is the actual emblem or the logo mm. of a political party that's going to be there. So it's not a face, per se. Yeah, Let okay. Clear, clear that. So this only affects his candidature to go to Parliament to represent MK. doesn't affect MK. It doesn't affect MK, but it does not mean that he will not be in the parliamentary list or he will not be representing Conduit sure. in Parliament. Okay. The Electoral Commission did not say who lodged the objections against Zuma. Uh, do you know who it was? Look, um, I've seen it in the media, and, uh, you know, there's obviously some speculation. Um, we've just received communique that came from uh, the IEC, um, and uh, we're reviewing the merits thereof. Okay, so we'll have to wait for we'll have to wait for the court papers to see, to find out who it was, because it's going to have to come out at some point, I would think. Absolutely ineffective, though. Okay. Um, so you released a statement over the weekend, and there was a small accident involving the former president's convoy. Now, you seem to be suggesting it wasn't really an accident. I mean, surely it was just a simple accident, wasn't it? <laughs> Stephen, you know, this is a serious matter. And actually, it's not a laughing matter. What we need to inform South Africans about is that this is the second such accident to have happened in a space of 18 months. It's just that the one that happened 18 months ago um, was didn't have as much media coverage uh, from yourselves in the media. But what is interesting about the initial one is that, uh, you know, a, it was very, very similar. It was a purported drunk driver that whose car went, uh, and went directly to President uh, Zuma's car out of five vehicles in a motorcade. One, you've asked your question, why his particular car would be close to about another five cars that surround his? Um, and two, it supports this person of junk. So do you draw the similarities to what has happened uh, over, the, over the last week? Absolutely. Again, same scenario, President Zuma, 
car out of the whole fleet um, of his motorcade is the one that's targeted by, again, a purported drunk driver. I so, don't know. Surely in Tlumulo, if, if there was some sort of deliberate action, um, I mean, don't you think it would be probably more serious than one car? I mean, you know, I mean, to use a drunk driver, it hardly sounds like anything's planned or deliberate here. Well, I mean, there's more than meets the eye. There's an observation. Um, and uh, that's what we find it very concerning. I mean, I had a conversation after that interview. I got a call from Minister Taylor. He called me um, where, you know, he raised certain concerns about what I said so without any particular mm. detail. And I, and I shared with him that, you know, we need to differentiate between politicking and his responsibility as an administrator, of which he clearly understood. I said, you know, President Zuma's motorcade is, has not been uh, refreshed or upgraded uh, for the past 8 to 10 years, and it cannot be, because then that in of itself, you know, does have serious uh, implications on his security. Well, and and we, we, we came to an agreement that uh, I'll be calling him and we'll be raising these issues and that they ought to be looked into. Okay, so, so I appreciate the fact that the minister called. Um, and also, then I, on the political side, I think we need to stop this uh, comments of, you know, Barry Zuma, because it doesn't help. Begin Tolo, mind, let me not forget, uh, you know, let me forget that he said Zuma will be in hospital before the 29th mm-hmm. of May. I mean, sure, there's a responsibility on Becky M. Tolo. There's a responsibility on members of MK, too, some of whom have been accused of threatening violence. I mean, it goes both ways. You'd expect you'd accept that, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I accept that uh, we do not uh, in any way associate, as I've mentioned, uh, any political environment or any rhetoric that could uh, create a violent or an environment that, that, that creates an impression that we are violent. We're not a violent party. We're a party that is for the people and represent a representation of the people. President Zuma is not a violent person. We represent President Zuma accordingly. And um, we draw discipline from President Zuma himself as an individual. Okay, so there'll be no more uh, use of figurative language that could sort of amount to violence as Becky Mtolo was using. Uh, there'll be no more threats of violence or anything like that from MK or any of its leaders or anyone. Anyone that makes such rhetoric or such comments or such utterances will be dealt with severely. Okay. In a sense that it could be to expulsion. We cannot tolerate that. Okay. Um, you would have seen the reports over the weekend in Lomulo around the Kaba family in KwaZulu Natal. In the name of Mfundo Nkaba, let me just explain where I'm going with this. He's in the news because prosecutors said last week he had made a payment to one of the men accused of killing AK and Tibbs. Now, that's got nothing to do with Zuma. Let, let me just be very clear. Let me explain how I get here. As part of the reporting that was mentioned that Zuma is actually related to the Kaba family, they're very well known in KwaZulu Natal. They're often described as sort of owning a fleet of minibus taxi, taxis. They're clearly an influential family. They've done very well over the years. Is it true? Because a lot of people are going to say a lot of things. So just for the record, I mean, is it true that Zuma's related to the family in some way? And everyone has different relationships with everyone else. But is there some relationship? Let's not draw inference. There's no inference or relation uh, to Mkondo Asizio, Stephen. Well, this has got nothing to do with Mkondo Asizio. How does this go? What has this got to do with Mkondo Asizio as a party and our campaign strategy? Okay, so so my question is, if Zoom is related to the to the Akaba family, um, if that's true, my next question to you would be: Are they helping to fund MK? Are they helping to, with some of your campaigning? Because you've clearly got a very well organised and well resourced campaign. There's nothing wrong with that. Every political party, people must donate money to whom they choose. But I'm just interested. I'm, you know me in Tlumulo, I'm curious about everything. <laughs> I know you're curious about everything, dude. But in this case. I mean, uh, I'm not aware of the Kaba family having funded us in any way. Um, and I can't comment beyond the fact that I'm not aware of any funding that comes from the Kaba family. Okay. Tlamula, I appreciate you putting answering the question. Thank you very much indeed for your time. And Tlamula and Tlela, this is the spokesperson from Kuntu at 19 minutes after 7. Across South Africa, online and on radio. SAFM, let's talk.
Well, electricity tariffs now officially going up by nearly 13%. If you get your power from a municipality, though, it should only go up from the 1st of July when their financial year starts. You know the impact that power prices have had on you over the last few years. Dr. Lumkile Mondi is an economist and a senior lecturer at the Witt School of Business. Dr. Mondi, good morning. Thanks very much indeed for your time. Uh, good morning, Stephen, and to beautiful people listening to your show this morning. We've had power, high power, how do I say this? We've had higher power prices, so power prices have gone up dramatically. I would say significantly, but dramatically is a better word, over the last 10 years. What impact has that had on our economy and on, on inflation? It must be huge. It, must, it is very huge, uh, um, uh, Stephen. We must remember that uh, our competitiveness... Uh, as well as our manufacturing base, which has been pivotal uh, in terms of driving our exports, building new capabilities in the manufacturing sector, uh, but more importantly, value addition that creates jobs that has been dented uh, since we started experiencing the, the power outages as a result of underinvestment uh, in ESCOM. Therefore, the capacity that we've lost over many, many years has significantly impacted uh, on the economy with job losses, with lack of competitiveness, but also a shrinking economy. And as a result also uh, of those challenges that we all know uh, of building new capacity at ESCOM and the slow uh, recovery rate that was offered to ESCOM by NERSA over years and the escalating debt uh, of ESCOM because of the problems at ESCOM, including the two programs at, at Kusile Medut, at, uh, at ESCOM, but as the capacity shrinks at ESCOM, and therefore someone has to start funding it to bring back ESCOM uh, to its uh, capabilities so that it can be able to borrow, uh, fix all the mistakes that is done, and continue to generate electricity in the transition that we're witnessing in South Africa and the rest of the world. So yes, it's going to impact because uh, we need more energy, we need ESCOM functioning, but more important also, we cannot afford, the industry cannot afford Therefore, the cost to the economy are going to be huge, as to the household as well, and therefore, of course, driving inflation high. But we are very encouraged that we have to take this as long as we can be able to create back the capabilities that are important at ESCOM. So, so we seem to almost be in this uh, vice. Eskim needs more money. If we don't pay more money, we won't get out of load shedding. If we stay in load shedding, we won't make money. I mean, is that the situation we're in? The situation I'm in is that somebody has to pay for the state capture, for the destruction of ESCOM and the manufacturing base. Unfortunately, people are going to pay for it, are going to be industry and households. Uh, and therefore, it is a period that we have to endure for some time until we get into speed, whereby private sector generates more energy for itself, households are able to do so. And ESCOM plays a pivotal role to support the grid and create a very stable network as we transition towards a much more diversified generation capacity, which we are building through now with the, with the, with the various programs that government and, uh, has implemented, including new sources of energy and new players in the market. The Reserve Bank said on Wednesday it expects load shedding to have much less of an impact this year. Do you think that's true? Is ESCOM getting better? It is very true. Uh, we must remember that the economy has shrunk, the demand has gone down, there's new private sector generation coming in. So all these mean that, uh, in general, uh, the, all the costs have been absorbed into the economy. The economy is smaller. So we don't expect much inflation drive, at least as a result of the load shedding uh, in the current environment. However, these are escalation coming to Tescom, and the ones that Muniz will add in July are likely to push in, uh, inflation uh, higher. We just hope that the global, uh, the global order does come to the senses uh, so that you know, we've got certainty as to global economy, so that the mining sector can start also coming back to stream. The impact that we're seeing across many of our commodities, be it manganese, uh, be it platinum, where we are very competitive, but we are suffering because of the global uh, geopolitical disorder. So hoping that by July, you know, there is some sense in all the wars going on.
Okay. And I mean, uh, this also gets to the problem that we have, really. Is that... Because our private inflation, that mm. the other drivers come through to make us competitive. Okay. So quite a lot needs to go right for electricity to Absolutely. have less of an impact on us. But I don't know. I mean, I, I, I used to be optimistic, but as I get older, I'm less optimistic, Dr. Monty. I mean, are we running a situation where we can be upset hugely by things that happen in other parts of the world? And that's always been South Africa's Stephen, sort I've of problem. All right. Uh, Dr. Mundi, I was asking, how much control do we actually have over all of this? Aren't we really at risk of being controlled by things happening in the rest of the world? Uh, China, for example. No, unfortunately, Stephen, we, we, we're going to have to create those capabilities and those new relations. Remember that you are a highly intended economy. We, we, cannot, we cannot raise more money internationally. Remember, South Africa is rated at the same rate as Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, so we need to really build another capacity in South Africa in terms of our financial control uh, and financial prudency so that we can improve our rating and therefore not depend so much on the East and the Newton Bank for funding, but get also international uh, players like, um, like the IMF and others international who can also give us money, including private sector, to rebuild our capacity. So unfortunately, we scored our own goal. So it's very, very difficult when you score your own goal to come back and become a good credit. And South Africa needs to do a lot of work. And I'm hoping that as we are rebuilding ESCOM, rebuilding other capabilities and state capacity, that will get there over years. But it will require the new government coming in in June uh, to do more. Uh, to really bring credibility to South Africa's graduateness and, uh, and and ability to attract other foreign visitors outside China uh, and other countries in the East. Dr. Lumkina Mondi, thank you very much indeed. Uh, senior lecturer, economist, as you can hear, at the Witt School of Business. All right, lots coming from that. And, of course, electricity going to have a big impact uh, on you, I'm afraid, and it is going up dramatically. 26 minutes now after 7 o'clock. This is SAFM Sport with Zai Khan. Zai, good morning. The Proteus women's team. Yes, they are knocking it out of the park, Steve. What I can tell you is that there's a new era for uh, talent and ambition. Cricket South Africa announcing a significant step forward. They've awarded 16 national contracts showcasing that they have a dedication in growing women's cricket. The spotlight is on new stars. Ayanda Hlubi of the Hollywood Bets Dolphins and Fidelity. Titans, Elise Marie Marks, both making waves with their well-deserved national contracts following a stellar debut season. Now, the development of women's cricket has been nothing short of remarkable. There's been the introduction of domestic semi-pro contracts with a competitive provincial structure that's already propelled South Africa's women to the T20 World Cup final. Now, the future looks bright as the Proteas are now gearing up for the upcoming T20 World Cup in Bangladesh with the solid backing of Cricket South Africa and the rise of young talents like Karaba Mizo and Madison Lansman. The stage is set for the Proteas women to continue their ascendancy onto the world stage. Now, women's soccer, Banyana Banyana coach Desiree Ellis insisting experience will count in their final hurdle towards Olympic qualification against Nigeria. Banyana arrived in Abuja, and that was on Sunday following their first leg clash against the Super Falcons and this will be played at the MKO Abiola National Stadium on the 5th of April before the return leg at Loftus Farsfall Stadium in Pretoria on the 9th of April. With many players returning to the national team following injury layoffs, Ellis says their experience from the Women's AFCON and the FIFA World Cup will be key. Experience of the likes of Rafi Wejani who's led this team with a plum, you know, by Manani was absolutely magnificent at the World Cup along with... um, with uh, Pongeka Kamedi, you know, and you need that experience because that experience is of players that have been in similar situations and being in similar situations and able to, being able to get out of the situations will really help us. Rugby now. The Blitzbox hit the ground running in Hong Kong yesterday with their first training session only a few hours after arriving in the Far East as action in the Hong Kong 7 kicks off on Friday. The Blitzbox will face Ireland. Ireland are currently second on the standings behind Argentina, five spots ahead of South Africa and they'll take on Spain in their first two pool matches as well on Friday. And we'll wrap up their pool fixtures come Saturday and that match will be against Samoa.
And let's go to cycling news. Primus Roglic started the Tour of Basque Country in blistering fashion with a strong individual time trial performance yesterday. The Bora Hansker rider beat out general classification contenders Remco Evanepoel and Jonas Vingegaard by 11 and 15 seconds respectively. And tennis action, Dominic Team picking up his first ATP Tour level win of the year battling to a three-sets victory with Maximilian Matera in the opening round of the Estoril Open. A team whose season has been hampered by the reoccurrence of a wrist injury completed a 6-1, 6-7, 6-4 victory in 2 hours and 17 minutes. Now the Austrian team, who currently sits 91 in the world rankings, will face the fourth seed, Alejandro Davidovic for Kina, and that's in the second round. And the other action that we saw at the Estoril Open, Roberta Batusta Agut improved his career record against Mirmermer Ketmanovic to win six times from as many meetings, beat the Serbian in the opening round. And that's a wrap of your sport on Sunrise. We'll bring you more top of the hour. I'm Zai Khan. Zai, thanks very much indeed. Good morning. You with SFM. We'll find out more about that horror bass crash in Lumpopo in the next half hour. Leading the conversation, no low chilling, 7.30. Thank you, Stephen. In your headlines, a Devon Metro police officer who allegedly stabbed his girlfriend to death is expected to make his first appearance in the Devon Magistrates Court today. The 27-year-old suspect, who's in police custody, allegedly stabbed his girlfriend, also a Metro police officer, inside a flat in the Devon in the Devon CBD at the weekend. A 51-year-old man is expected to appear before the Eshowe Magistrates Court in KwaZulu Natal on charges of drunken driving and reckless and negligent driving. In a statement. Police say the men's vehicle collided with former President Jacob Zuma's official Ahmad State vehicle. And state television in the Democratic Republic of Congo has announced the appointment of Judith Suminua as the country's first female prime minister. Since inauguration for a second term in January of President Felix Chisakedi, there have been intense talks on establishing a coalition government. I'll have details on these and other stories at 8. SAFM guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Uh, Heavy backlogs out of Pretoria this morning, down towards the airport. You've got two uh, incidents to concern yourself with. One is a collision scene and one south at Linwood Road. Uh, that is very quickly uh, pushed traffic all the way back through to uh, Storham Full Road. So if you're on ramping from Montana, say off at uh, Sekifako Makato, or you're coming down through Pumalani Plaza, uh, by the time you get to Storham Full Road, you're in the thick of it right through, uh, passing that crash and down towards uh, Fontaine. So perhaps something else has happened. Uh, once you emerge from that, it opens up. But then if you split onto the R21, you sit from St. George's Hotel Territory uh, down to Clayville into the uh, roadworks. The N3 going north from Germiston Alberton Territory. That's heavy. A breakdown uh, before Galulis plus the roadworks around Van Buren. So that's all heavily backed up. And some problems out of Soweto this morning. The M1 North just queuing and sitting in some pressure up towards the Maresburg off ramp. Ahead of that, you'll just pick up some delays from 14th Avenue right round to Ravonia Road. That section of the N1 through the northern areas of Joburg uh, for the last probably couple of months has just generally uh, got busier and busier by the day. It really is um, jamming across all lanes there. Uh, collision coming out of Chatsworth, just south of Durban, the Higginson Highway, uh, that collision by Bayview, so there's some delays there from central Chatsworth. M13 is heavy out of point, and you've got the roadworks at Paradise Valley plus a broken down vehicle in the mix as well today. Uh, Cape Town, the earlier prang on the N2 inbound at Kailicha by the R300, that scene is being cleared. Uh, the N2 busy normalising through there. N1 inbound through Cryfontaine Brackenfell, quite slow, traffic just sitting through the Brackenfell Boulevard territory, and then the N7's worth a mention, queuing just after Four Trekker Road, just north of Four Trekker Road, as you sit all the way through to the uh, Bossman's Darm Road exit. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. The Business Update on SAFM. Jimmy Moyaha, our <laughs> business show host with us this morning. Jimmy, good morning. Asian markets, US markets closed, but there's some data. How's it looking? Morning, Stephen. Uh, U.S. markets uh, had a bit of a trade yesterday, so they were down uh, yesterday. And if we look at the futures at the moment, they are still down about a third of a percent in trading uh, overnight. If we look at the Asian markets, they continue to perform uh, in a bit of a mixed fashion, uh, starting with uh, some markets out uh, in 
The Philippines, they're up about 0.6%, but Chinese markets, uh, Shanghai down uh, 0.1%, uh, Nifty in India up about, or down rather, a third of a percent, while uh, Korean markets up 0.4%, and Hong Kong up 2.3%. Tokyo is sitting flat at the moment. Uh, we see, we know that most markets were closed yesterday for uh, the Easter Monday. We expect that U, uh, UK markets will be back, uh, South African markets as well will be back in later uh, trade uh, later today. If we look at some of the gold Gold prices or commodities prices over the weekend uh, going into this week, $2,254 an ounce on the gold price, up almost 3% at the moment. Brent crude etching closer to $90, sitting at $87.45 a barrel, with platinum pricing sitting at $917 or $918. That's slightly up. Palladium prices also above $1,000 there. So, Metals pricing are doing rather well at this start of the week. Currencies, the rand a little softer against the dollar 1892 at the moment, against the pound and the euro slightly firmer at 20 rand and 30 cents against the euro and 23 rand and 74 cents against the pound. We'll have to keep an eye on that to see how that opens up when the South African markets uh, do come back to trade. But by all accounts, it looks as though there is some dollar strength in the market. We have a couple of data points coming out of this week. We have the uh, inflation print from the European uh, region, so EU inflation print coming out tomorrow. Alongside that, we have ADP data and expected commentary from Fed Chair Jerome Powell in the US with non-farm jobs data out of the US also out on a Friday. Chinese markets will only be trading until uh, the end of business tomorrow. They have a holiday on Thursday and Friday. So going to be an interesting week in the markets this week. And then SARS revenue data is out today. I mean, it's a very good dipstick of our economy, isn't it? Yes, uh, revenue collections. So preliminary rev revenue collections are going to be reported on this week. We'll have a press briefing around midday uh, today. I'll be speaking to the commissioner this evening on our show, uh, hopefully just to get a better sense of where SARS stands from a revenue collection point of view, what that means for the National Treasury's budget deficit and the budget expectations that we got. Uh, we had our budget speech in February, and there was a lot that was said around the fact that the deficit is expected to widen because revenue collections elections are not keeping up with the pace of expenditure. So it'll be interesting to see what the preliminary data suggests and where SARS is uh, sitting, or what they're thinking about this new tax year as we go into that. As I said, I'll have a conversation about that later tonight on our show, and we'll see if we can get some insights from SARS themselves. Uh, Jimmy, thanks very much indeed. Jimmy Moyaha, of course, our business show host with us this week, uh, gratefully. And uh, you'll hear him this evening. Very important conversations coming up. 24 minutes to eight. Call us on 086-000-2032. All right, calls coming through around food prices, ETOLs, former President Zuma. I do first, though, want to go to Clanty in Cape Town. And last week, Clanty caught us just before uh, the long weekend. Then his grandmother, I think it was, had been told to go to a hospital. She was going to be transported to another hospital because no one had come with her. She was told she would have to stay there on her own for a very long period of time. Then the deputy held minister uh, phoned in to try and resolve it. Let's find out what happened. Clunty, good morning. Good morning, Stephen, and how are you? I'm well, thank you. How's your grandmother? No, she's fine now, Stephen. Thanks to you and the people of South Africa who called me there after. What, happen what happened, Stephen, is after I've called you, the minister immediately called me uh, and wanted to know what happened. And I explained the situation to the minister. And then he promised me that he's going to attend to this and uh, within 10 minutes, after I've spoken to Dr. Uh, Dr. Sibasene yeah, Dlomi is the yes. Deputy Minister. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, the grandmother sent me a please call from Spectrum mm. Hospital to say the ambulance was there. I was shocked to know that sure. within 10 minutes, the ambulance was there. After she was advised to go to the taxi rank and take a taxi to mm. Frontier Hospital. But what worries me most of them is after I've spoken to you, I called the CEO of the hospital, Dr. Mm. Tongo or Tombo. He was so arrogant and firm to say that it is the law that mm. if a grain is not accompanied by someone, they are not going to load him or her to the, to mm. the ambulance. And I asked Dr. Tongo, what if the grain does not have anyone to assist? He, sa he said to yeah. me, he has to get a neighbor. I said, what if the neighbor's? Mm. I'm not available. Mm. 
He said that is not the problem of the hospital. I asked, what, why can't we ask the security to assist? He said, no, that is not the responsibility of the security. Sure. I asked him why the drivers of the ambulance cannot assist. He said that is not their responsibility. Mm. Then the, the conversation ends there, but I, I really want to thank Dr. Smoggy Seni Gromo, the MEC of Health in the Eastern Cape, and all the people that mm. were involved. The granny is, was taken to hospital and is having an appointment for Thursday this week to go back okay. to the hospital so that it, she can be operated. Granti, look, good luck to, to your grandmother. We'll be thinking of her. And to, get, to have an operation when you're, old, when you're a bit elderly is not, not easy. Um, and I'm glad we were able to help. And as you know, we try and help where we can. Um, and I'm sorry that you had the whole experience. I think, Granti, you're speaking for many, many people who have had similar experiences. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much. All right. Conti on the line from Cape Town phoned us last week and just said, look, this has happened. Is there anything we could do? And within seconds, it was quite interesting, actually. The Deputy Health Minister phoned. We're very lucky with that. We try and help where we can, but uh, no promises. All right. Uh, you know, very difficult. So, But glad that's ended well. And I'm sure things like that do happen from time to time. Sibasiso and KwaZulu-Natal, you want to talk about the new radio season? Hello, Sibasiso. Yes, good, good good morning, Stephen, and the production team. How are you, sir? I'm well. Go for it. Yeah, I wish to congratulate you and recommend you guys for entering the, the new season. Uh, you, 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 help, you help many people with intervention in many mm-hmm. instances. Well, thank you, CBC, so that's very kind. Yeah, what I would like to suggest and recommend, I, I hope and I know uh, the managers are listening for mm-hmm. quality assurance. Uh, actually, I'm a visually impaired somebody. Yes. And I listen to SAF FM 24-7. Oh, yes. 365. Yes. So, uh, from the morning show up until 12 midnight. Hmm. Then 12 midnight, because I'm using an old analog radio. Yes. Uh, I, I have a Blompong a blom- and a Tempest. Yes. I, I, which uses uh, the, 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 the knob. Yes, yes, yes. So then, when the, the transmission ends at, at 12 midnight, uh, I wish to continue listening to the news. Oh, I see. So, the, so then I have to turn on the local radio station, mm. which has BBC World Radio Service. Yes. And I'm suggesting if the SAFM uh, managers can consider mm. uh, transmitting BBC World Radio service from oh, midnight yes. up to 3 a.m. Yes. Okay. No, CBC, so that's an interesting idea. I must say I hadn't thought of it. It's none of, it's none of you know, it's, it's beyond my pay grade. Um, but that is something worth looking at. I mean, I remember years ago listening to it on, the, on this frequency. Years ago. Yes. Because, because what? Uh, as... Uh, we, we are the audience as yeah. the visually impaired people. Yes. So the break, the breaking news. Yes. We don't get breaking news from uh, yes. from twelve midnight up to morning. If you can make twelve midnight up to morning, it must be meant. There, there must be somebody yes. who so that whenever there is breaking news there, somebody yes, must break the news because okay. from ten to twelve. Yeah. Uh, in the evening, we used to get some breaking news from Oliver Dixon. If, if there's something mm. huge yeah. happening in the country, there must be a breaking news. Somebody will break okay. the news for the visually impaired sure. people. Sure. Because I can't open uh, uh, the TV because TV does not work for me, you see. No, Sibo Cecil, thank you. On the line from KZN, it's an important idea. I'll I'll raise it. I can't do more than that, I'm afraid. And in a way, you've already raised it, so thank you. Tommy in Greytown. Hi, Tommy. Uh, your response to Kanti about what happened in the hospital? Yes, 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 yes. Well, first and foremost, in terms of the event analysis, mm. I think we must commend yourself who raised the matter and the people who responded. Uh, the, the deputy minister and the minister and everybody who actually ensured that, that they responded. But going to the future, I'm still worried because to me, this is just an isolated event that we're picking up, which might be a representative of what is going on there. 
Now, there's, there's something fundamentally wrong in what the CEO is saying. First and foremost, Stephen, I think he argues that the rules does not allow a granny to be assisted in whatever form. Yeah. Now, we need to establish the factual basis of that. Yeah. Which, which rule, which, from which legislation, what was in the minds of the people, if there is such a rule? Mm. Because more often than not, people, they talk about mm. rules that not only mm. a, a approved by parliament, but that exist in their own heads. Why am I saying that? Government exists for the people. The people, the grannies and others, are the ones who create, who are the owners of sure. government system. They put money so that they can derive the return of investment from the investment of their tax. Now, this person is an employee, is paid by the granny, the owner of mm. the system. Mm. And I don't believe that we'll be having such rules. If, yes, we do have such rules, yeah. it means then they, they, those rules will have to be changed. But I don't mm. believe there is such a rule that says mm. uh, your assistant you is, be... is dependent on somebody else. Yeah. Remember that it's only the minors. And even if you're a minor, we are not, we are not uh, uh, disbarred mm. from getting the service. No, sure. The health service. All right, so, no, so, ta- so. yeah, Tommy in Great Town, thank you. I mean, I think you, I think you raise a good point. I was surprised to hear that that was a rule. If someone's over the age of eighteen, they're sort of legally allowed to look after themselves. So it's a very strange thing. Tommy, thank you. Quarter to eight. At SFM Radio and at Stephen Grutus on Twitter. A series of very bad fires and informal settlements in Cape Town over the long weekend. More than 700 people now, unfortunately, left homeless. Two people were killed and uh, very difficult situations. I mean, obviously, as you can just imagine how difficult they would be. There was one in Dürnbach, there was one in Lange, uh, but a very difficult situation that's been developing there. Charlotte Powell is, is the head of public awareness in the city's Dis- Disaster Risk Management Centre in the city of Cape Town. Charlotte, good morning. Good morning to you and to all the listeners. How bad is the situation people are facing after these fires? Yes, it has been a terrible week in um, in light of informal settlement fires. We had approximately 340 or 350 actually um, damaged um, dwellings, leaving about 800 people displaced. Um, and this was in the Joe Slovo informal settlement in Langa, as well as Dwanabak Swizwe. And then in Mufulini, that was the bigger one with 200 structures and leaving approximately 410 people affected. What help are you able to actually give people? I mean, they must be desperate. Their belongings have gone. They also need accommodation now. Yes, absolutely. So um, we've immediately activated our joint operations uh, center. Um, and that was um, we activated that on site in 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 both two bigger incidents, which was in in Duwanambak Sizwe as well as Mufulini, where the two hundred structures was destroyed. And then we that was the purpose just to ensure that we can coordinate relief efforts as well as response efforts. And we assisted communities with our humanitarian partners, Islamic Relief and Gift of the Givers, um, and then also. Um, Our various city services was also on site, as well as the National Human Settlements Department, working together with our city Human Settlements Department, um, also discussing plans for rebuilding. Obviously, uh, over winter in Cape Town, it's usually quite wet. It can be very windy, but wet for quite a long period of time. So you don't have the sort of dryness in Gauteng, which makes, uh, well, in the high felt, that makes a, a fire more dangerous. But are you worried that as it gets colder, more and more people will be using paraffin stoves, things like that and so the number of fires will increase absolutely you know that um cape town is known for two risks one um one is fires during our summer period and actually throughout the year and then also during our winter period it's flooding so yes um communities do use unstaved stoves which causes accidental fires and cooking on open flames so that is a concern but um, most of our settlements it has got electricity. So, um, but then there's also the cost of electricity. So many of the communities are using open f- open flames and unsafe stoves. Thank you very much indeed, Charlotte Powell. I really appreciate the time. Head of Public Awareness at in the city's dis- disaster risk management centre in the city of Cape Town. Twelve minutes now to eight. SAFM guiding you through the rush hour traffic.
Well, it's looking better through Pretoria. A breakdown at an earlier crash around uh, Linwood Road have all been cleared up. So there's a bit of pressure coming through from Stormful right down to the R21, but it's certainly off its uh, heaviest. Uh, then you get the N1, which is queuing from Brockfontein down to New Road, and the R21 just approaching the uh, Olifantsfontein exit. Heavy backlogs as you uh, pick up the roadworks uh, there. That, of course, is a delay if you're leaving Pretoria towards the airport and flight connections. N1 slow this morning from Randburg right through to Sunning Hill, and then just after Ravonia, a crash getting up into Baclou interchange. So traffic all the way through, really, from Bayers Nordea up to uh, Baclou. And a breakdown going into Galudis on the entry north. Traffic remains heavy uh, from the cement factory territory. You've got the left lane closure for road works at Van Buren, and then the broken down vehicle after that. Uh, Durban's M13, very heavy out of the uh, Pine Town area. A breakdown which sort of backed things up on top of the road works at Paradise Valley is being cleared. But uh, M13 from St John's Avenue Bridge down to the M3 stays bad. Uh, crash on the Higginson Highway at Bayview a little earlier this morning, uh, just causing some delays coming out of Chatsworth and the M7 if you're bluff bound uh, queuing through the N2 down towards the uh, roadworks that you pick up on uh, Bel Air Road. Cape Town today, N1 into town, slow from Platycliffe Road to Cuba, get a change, more delays up over the elevated freeway. M5 is looking fairly heavy from Kettleworth towards the N2 and the N7's got a lot of traffic on it, uh, queuing up passing Langer towards Viking Way at Epping and then another decent sized queue and slow down uh, between Four Trekker Road and the Bossman's Dam Road exit into Century City and Montague Gardens. Rob Byrne. SAFM traffic. Across South Africa, online and on radio. SAFM, let's talk. Ten minutes to eight the time. Lots of calls coming through at the moment, as you can imagine. Uh, still haven't taken your calls around former President Zuma. We'll try and get to those uh, if we can in just a moment. So, yeah, issues coming through around that. Don't forget, we'll be talking about cigarettes and the illicit cigarette economy from 8.30. So we'll be looking at that in the next little while as well. Busy time, of course, for the Border Management Authority. We know that there's been a very large number of people who've been going in and out of the border over the Easter period um, and so we know that that's been very busy uh, let's just check with the Border Management Authority to see how it's actually gone because there's been a huge amount of traffic and then of course also just managing all the business of it as well I think is uh, very important to do so yeah let's see what we can find out there Stephen uh, Van Neel is the Deputy Assistant Commissioner for the Border Management Authority Deputy Assistant Commissioner good morning Good morning, uh, Stephen, and uh, good morning to your listeners. Was it as busy as you thought it would be going in and out of the country over the Easter period? Stephen, not as what we thought, uh, and perhaps it could uh, be much busier, but uh, we, we, we obviously do not complain. It was our first anniversary as a border management authority, as we also had our one year in existence. So uh, the numbers had not gone up to the level that we thought, but uh, we could manage that numbers. Okay, so were there there weren't long queues and things like that as a result? Not really. Uh, we have seen uh, movement uh, through the port that we normally have uh, larger, uh, you know, uh, traveller movements like, for instance, the Bombo, Bait Bridge, and uh, two of the Free State ports into uh, Lesotho. But we haven't seen the numbers that we had previously, so uh, it was quite a uh, a real quiet uh, weekend. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because there are certain factors that affect whether people move around or not. One of them is money. Is there any money? I don't know if people have money. The other is when school holidays are and when they aren't. Any idea yet as why there wasn't as much traffic as you were expecting? Yeah, absolutely. I think the latter, actually both of these two factors that you've mentioned are real at play here because, uh, Stephen says, the uh, school holiday started before the Easter period and uh, Public schools are opening tomorrow, so we have maybe seen some of the movement back, but some of the private schools are only opening next week. So you had the situation that schools were not really in the period of uh, Easter, and that might be one of the reasons. But also to just mention, Stephen, um, I mean, we just got out of the uh, what we would call our festive operations, which is the December, January. And uh, our Easter was so close to it in terms of proximity that yeah. We also believe that could have been another reason. Yeah, Easter was very early this year. All right, lessons for the next time, Deputy Assistant Commissioner. You're a year old, as you say. Um, obviously, you're learning as you go. Do you think that uh, the next big migration, probably Christmas, there might be one or two before then, you're getting better at this? I mean, obviously, nobody wants a queue, but everyone wants to be safe. Yeah, absolutely. We're well proving, uh, Stephen. And I think the 12 months has actually shown this. I mean, last year in December was, the first operation that BMA has run by itself and not be supporting by any other sort of, uh, you know, mother department or so. 
And that went also pretty much well. So uh, we're actually very happy the way that we are putting things together. And as we now at least have another nine or ten months as we are preparing for the December, we should be much better at the end of this year. And as you rightfully say, our performance and our efficiency normally get measured at the delivery that we give our, our travelers at ports, like, for instance, you know, the queues that are there. And that is not obviously what we would like to see, but there's also other factors that obviously influence that compliance to some of our entry and actual requirements, and there is a role that the public also play in that. Stephen Faneel, thank you. Deputy Assistant Commissioner for the Border Management Authority with SFM, six minutes to eight. Well, one of the awful things that happened over the weekend as people were traveling is this massive a bus crash. 45 people from Botswana were traveling through Limpopo on Thursday. The bus went 50 meters, it seems, off a bridge into a ravine. I mean, just the most awful story. The only person who survived is an eight-year-old girl. Can you imagine? Well, one of the people who's had to deal with that over the weekend is a health MEC in Lumpopo, Dr. Popi Ramatuba. MEC, good morning to you. Just the most awful bus crash. Any idea yet as to what caused it? Uh, morning, Stephen, and morning to all your listeners out there. I think the investigations by both the police and the traffic department is still on, uh, but those who know that that, that bridge has got a sharp curve, and for, for now we, we don't know exactly what could have happened, whether the driver lost control mm. and then the, the, the bus, bus crashed mm. and, and fell uh, over the 50 meters. But let's, let's just give the police space and mm. the traffic department. Mm. They will definitely report back to us as soon as they are done with their investigations. Um, obviously, there's a big investigation now because you've got to identify the, the, the victims. It's a terrible situation. Are you working with the police in Botswana for that? I mean, this. I mean, I can't imagine what it was like. I don't know if it was you or someone else from our government had to phone the Botswana government and say, look, this is what's happened to 45 of your people. Yeah, yes, indeed, Stephen. If you remember on, on, on the Friday, on the Good Friday, immediately after the, the accident happened, um, we have been in contact with uh, through our uh, DECO, and, and the DDG has always been hands on with us and the High Commissioner. They both uh, visited uh, our facility where uh, we have stored the remains in our uh, forensic uh, pathology at Mkopani Hospital. We have been working together with them, and, and of course, um, General Mulaudi from the, the SAPS. Uh, has put up also his team from our side and also uh, has assisted us uh, with the Botswana government. We are, as a province, are expecting the forensic pathologists from uh, Botswana to be joining us this week because, uh, uh, you know, for us to be able to identify, especially those that are bent beyond recognition, we, we will have to get the, 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 the specimen from the other side mm. uh, in terms of their uh, next of kin or their family members and, and also from our side here uh, where, where we are going to dissect on and, and get mm. that. So that work uh, will definitely need the two teams to be working together, mm. not just the police uh, from this side and that side, but equally the forensic pathologists uh, together. We are working together with the Botswana government, and and I think up to so far we have not yet encountered any challenges mm. that can stop us from continuing with the work. MEC, I really appreciate the time. The time, thank you, Dr. Popio Ramatuba is the MEC for Health in uh, in Limpopo. So yeah, very very difficult story emerging. Imagine just uh, one eight year old girl surviving that. Three minutes to eight. Call us on 086-000-2032. Pumzile on the line from the Eastern Cape. Pumzile, hi. I'm Kunto Wisizwe and uh, former President Zuma. Greetings, SG. Quickly, man. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I must uh, remember that, of course, you're a counsellor for the ANC when you speak. No, it's fine. It's fine, SG. No. SG, you know, uh, I just wanted to comment on this issue of the accident. Yeah. Um, and the guy charged, and it's totally disingenuous, you know, for the spokesperson of the, the Zumam Kondo mm. uh, to come on air and say that uh, it's actually uh, suspected uh, foul play on it, you know. Mm. 
You know, these people are just attention seekers. And they look, an accident is an accident. It could have happened to anybody. To mm. come here at this platform and mislead the South Africans as if that this was a well orchestrated and planned. How can you plan an accident? Yeah. You know? It's very questionable. That is all I wanted to say. You know, they are just attention seekers, you know? All right. Look, Pumzila, I mean, you know, we, we've we all seen movies and things. But I, I see your point. I mean, for me, this is always why it boils down to the evidence, you know? No, no. No, I hear you. I hear you. But thank you very much. You had a very good interview with him, by the way, you know? Well, thanks. I don't know if he sees it like that. Pumzila in the Eastern Cape. Thanks, man. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, Pumzila, as you know, is a, a counsellor for the ANC. Uh, there. All right. Uh, lots to come in the next little while. Uh, we'll welcome back Ashraf Garda coming back to SFM. He'll be on your radio station from 3 until 6 in the evening. So, uh, afternoon drive, I suppose, in radio terms, uh, you would call it. But looking forward to that. I haven't spoken to Ashraf for ages and ages and ages so we'll welcome him back uh, to SAFM we'll also talk about uh, talk a little bit about rugby we don't often talk about rugby on this show well only when we win a world cup which I suppose happens fairly often but uh, talking about the curry cup one of the oldest I think it's the oldest rugby competition in the world does seem to be in danger now because of changes to the global season takes you to a conversation around essentially how the global game is managed it's also about player safety so that's a big issue and then um, just to mention we had a call from a doctor. The person asked not to go on air. We won't give you their name. But they phoned in and said, look, this issue around whether ambulances can take frail people without help. And this person says there actually is a rule that says an ambulance can't take a frail person who will need assistance. So in other words, if you're elderly, you would have to take a friend with you. That's what we're hearing now. So look, I don't work in the in, the, in that sector, but that's what we're hearing now. So, you know, there, there are obviously different things going on here. And Conti, we just think of your your grandmother and she's got that operation on Thursday. You are SFM leading the conversation at o'clock. Thank you, Stephen. In your top stories, the Durban Metro Police officer Jew in court for allegedly killing girlfriend, and the DRC appoints the first female prime minister. This is SAFM News. A very good morning. I am Luanda Maume. A Durban Metro Police officer who allegedly stabbed his girlfriend to death is expected to make his first appearance before the Durban Magistrates Court today. The victim was also a Metro Police officer. The 27 year old suspect, who's in police custody, allegedly allegedly stabbed his girlfriend inside a flat in the Deben CBD at the weekend. Nonjabulam Dungamagamo reports. According to police, the couple were believed to be drinking alcohol when the man allegedly stabbed the woman to death. It is also reported that the suspect then took videos and pictures of the victim taking her last breath and sent this to several people and posted on social media. For SABC News, I'm Nonjabulam Dungamagamo in Durban. A 51-year-old man is expected to appear before the SOA Magistrates Court in Guazulu Natal today on charges of drunken driving and reckless and negligent driving. In a statement, police say the man's vehicle collided with former President Jacob Zuma's official Ahmad State vehicle. The incident happened on Thursday night on the R66 when Zuma was believed to be traveling between Gandla and SOA. Police have confirmed that at the time of the collision, Zuma was in the vehicle with his protectors. No one was injured in the crash. Rise Mzansi will today stage a picket outside the offices of the Labour Department in Pretoria as part of its election campaign. The picket is aimed at demanding jobs and employment opportunities for individuals over the age of 35. The political party says after its engagement with different communities across the country, it has realized that one of the major main concerns is a lack of jobs. Rise Mzansi leader is Songa Zozibi. The only way to solve this ageism problem is to not have it. It's just remove the rule and uh, provide training opportunities to as many South Africans as possible so that those South Africans can escape the, the trap of sometimes skills-related unemployment. The listeners need to know that 89% of all unemployed people either have just metric or no metric at all. Mm. You do not solve that problem by saying if you're over 35, uh, you shouldn't get a job. 
Tip, the Department of Social Development has condemned the murder of a 45-year-old woman who was shot and killed by her husband while attending a church service. The incident occurred at Makonde Shatani village outside Toyando in Limpopo. Departmental spokesperson Joshua Guapa. We condemn this killing in the strongest possible terms. We are appealing to members of the community to help the police with information which will lead to the arrest and prosecution of the suspect. We have dispatched a team of social workers to the family to provide psychosocial support and will continue to provide necessary support following this brutal murder. Trans-African Concessions, which manages the N4 toll route, has advised motorists to expect increased traffic volumes on major routes between Mozambique and Gauteng in South Africa. People have been returning home after the Easter break and ahead of the opening of schools tomorrow. More than 2,000 vehicles per hour have been recorded passing through the Nkomazi and Machado toll plazas heading towards the Highfield. Track spokesperson Solange Suarez Nicholson says their toll plazas westbound are extremely busy. Easy. We're seeing the traffic flow steadily increase by the hour and we expect peak traffic to occur between early and late afternoon today. We urge all road users to be diligent, patient and cautious and obey every road safety rule and uh, should they have an emergency or would like to report an incident, they are more than welcome to contact our 24-hour help desk on 0800 87 22 64. And finally, State Television in the Democratic Republic of Congo has announced the appointment of Judith Suminwa as the country's first female prime minister. Since the inauguration for a second term in January of President Felix Tshisekedi, there have been intense talk of on establishing a coalition government. The BBC's David Banford reports. Judith Suminwa, Congo's planning minister, has been named as the new prime minister. She's an economist and has been tasked with pushing President Shisekedi's declared priority for his second term, advancing national cohesion in this fractured and vast country. Technically, Congo should be wealthy thanks to its minerals. In practice, those same minerals have encouraged corruption and militia violence, leaving the general population insecure and impoverished. Recapping your top story, a Deben Metropolis office who allegedly stabbed his girlfriend to death is expected to make his first appearance before the Deben Magistrates Court today. For SAFM News, I am Luanda Maume. Headlines at 8.30. A very good morning to you in your SFM Sunrise Sports Soccer. Banyana Banyana's coach unveils a dynamic squad for the Olympic qualifier against Nigeria. And in rugby, the Lions, they gear up to roar back in the Challenge Cup showdown with Benetton. Stay tuned for the details just before 8.30. AFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. The M1 South moving through Pretoria, busy this morning. Rather than heavy, there's just traffic all the way through from sort of Stormful Road to the R21. It's a result of some earlier breakdowns and an earlier collision, but they've all been cleared up. The R21 still heavy approaching Clayville. If you're on your way to the airport, make sure you've got plenty of time to get through that backlog. Uh, it is uh, quite severe again. Morning and afternoon peak times. The uh, roadworks here attract fairly heavy delays. Uh, William Mandela turning into Santon Drive at Parkmore. That's heavy, so behind that report. Public road leaving Ramberg quite slow. And there's a backlog, uh, two of them, in fact, to work through on the Mike One. There's delays between Boysons and Crown. And then from Empire Road, moving through to about sort of 11th Avenue. Uh, Going to hit some more and additional queues there as well. Uh, Durban's end to north. It's uh, been a heavy one this morning from the M7. It is starting to calm down, but there's still a delay moving through Spaghetti Junction up to the road to Exit Westwood Mall. Uh, the M13 from St. John's Avenue down to Pine Downs uh, Paradise Valley, heading out of Pine Town towards the M3. Along that M13 stays really busy as well today. And Cape Town's just been quite a big crash in on the N2 inbound between the M5 and Elizabeth Parkway. Uh, traffic along that N2 corridor backlogging from as far as Langer. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. SAFM Sunrise. A vivid start to your day. Seven after eight. Good morning. You're with SFM, SFM Sunrise. I'm Stephen Crutus. Good to have you along uh, with us this morning. You know the number, 086-000-2032. Conversations to come around former President Jacob Zuma. I think people still talking about that. We're going to focus on illicit cigarettes uh, around 20 minutes from now. Really important, just how that industry has changed. And part of it, I have to say, seems to have happened. I mean, it can't be a coincidence uh, during the lockdown and the pandemic. So we'll talk about that and just get a better understanding of that conversations too uh, still to come as well around uh, the rugby season and how that's changing eight after eight
Stephen Kruetis on SAFM. Well, as you know, from time to time, a radio station makes certain changes in its lineup. And last week, unfortunately, we had to say goodbye to Eldrin Simpier. He's left us. But now we get to announce the return of Ashraf Ghada. He was here when I arrived. He's returning to your airwaves from three to six in the afternoons. Ashraf, good morning. It's been a long time. Welcome back. Yeah, good morning, Stephen. It's it's interesting because you just made the point. I know when you you joined in, I interviewed you, uh, and that's like six years ago, and now... You were the new boy then. I'm the new boy now. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lesson about life there. There's a wheel, a song, or something. How have you been? How are you doing? Are you looking forward to today? I, I certainly am, right? Uh, you know, Andile, the program manager, said, Ashraf, when you speak to Stephen, make sure you have your best radio voice. I said, I've been rehearsing the entire week. But seriously, I, I've been pretty well. Um, in the last, uh, well, five years since since I was on SAFM. But of course, in that period, I mean, I've done a lot of moderating, uh, hosting of debates on, on digital platforms, uh, as, as we often do, and, you know, building the, the Champion South Africa project that I've been involved in, right? So I, I feel pretty good, but, but certainly when the when the offer came to say, mm. um, Ashraf, um, would you consider coming back to SAFM? Then my immediate response was, you know, two things. One is I have unfinished business at SFM because I've always been connected to the to the station. And mm. I listen avidly, by the way, mm. to, to yourself and, mm. and to Arun before. Mm. Uh, and, and number two, I think the opportunity to speak to the entire nation, mm. um, particularly in an election year. You know, people often forget that SAFM really means South Africa FM. And we tend to forget mm. that we are a, a talk station that is able to connect to the entire South Africa, and that is a huge privilege. It really is. I mean, I was going to ask, I mean, what's changed? I mean, you've you've been sort of away for a little while, and the country's changed. And then I was reminded, well, here we are all still talking about Jacob Zuma. So I don't know if much has changed. Well, well you're right. Not, not, nothing, I mean, the, the challenges clearly remain. Absolutely, and 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 you know, and maybe and maybe this is you know just to segue into the, into the title mm. of, of of the show for the afternoon. It's called the National Pulse, and and that links completely to your question that you know we need to feel what is the nation's pulse. What what is what is the national pulse? Mm. And the pulse maybe five or ten years ago, and the and the issues that affect our pulses and get us racing still remain. So. Uh, in, in that sense, we need to mirror the pulse, but also have the conversations that will get South Africa moving, because I think there is a nation that, that needs to be led on the one hand, and we need to do that. But on the other hand, you and I know that SFM mm-hmm. listeners are, are are super intelligent, and they're all mm-hmm. generally activists, and I think often we are led by them, which is, a, again, a great privilege. I mean, I've always thought, and I mean, you know, different shows try and do different things, so Cathy will sort of delve deeper into things, for example. Um, but for you, I suppose, you know, three to six, conversations move quite quickly, news, conversations of the moment. Uh, uh, you talk about the national pulse. I mean, that's pretty much it, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, if, if you if you deal with the uh, with South Africa at sunrise, and then you know, for us, it's every uh, sort of getting into into sunset, and in between all of that, that is what we must cover. So I think a lot of it may mirror some of the things that that you do. But yes, th- there would be other things that mm-hmm. inevitably uh, come mm-hmm. through. Like you know, a lot of people have asked me, Astra, would you be doing some marketing? Because you know, I used to host a marketing and branding show before. And although there's, it's not a set feature, the, the reality is there are issues that we must cover. And again. All those issues must be driven in so far as how they impact on the national pulse. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, Ashraf, look, uh, good luck. Welcome back. Um, and I mean, I've, I find, and yes, I, I wake up slightly early, but for me, the big thing about it is to enjoy it. Um, you know that better than I do. I mean, it's just enjoying it and you enjoy it because of the people you talk to, the people you learn from, and I suppose putting your finger on the pulse of it all, really. Well, well, absolutely. And, you know, someone asked me this yesterday and I said, you know, and, you know, both you and I have done have done TV and radio. And, you know, TV is so visual. It's it's always like what you see. But, but radio is really what what the audience feels. OK. And and for us to be again in that position mm-hmm. of engaging an audience and, and understanding how they feel and how we feel because of how they feel. I mean, that is that is just mm-hmm. a super privilege. Absolutely. Well, Ashraf Garda, look, good luck. Enjoy it. Um, and I think it's going to I think you're going to have a lot of fun this afternoon. Thank you. And come and hold my hand. I'm, I'm the new guy. You know, three to six. <laughs> Ashraf Garda doesn't need anyone to hold his hand, let me tell you that. He'll be with you from three to six this evening on The National Pulse. Welcome back to SAFM, Ashraf, 13 minutes after eight. 
Call us on 086-000-2032. All right, lots of calls. We took lots of calls earlier, and we haven't been able to get to everyone this morning just because so many different things uh, have been going on. Let's start with Muzi and KwaZulu Natal. Muzi, hi. Uh, the sort of car accident in former President Zuma. Uh, yeah, good morning, Stephen. Uh, this is Muzi, uh, the MK member. Mm. Yeah, uh, I really don't like to answer to Pumzile, the, the previous caller who spoke about uh, the accident of the president. Yeah. But uh, I'll, 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 I'll try and, and, and take you back uh, from where um, one of the uh, KZN leaders, uh, ANC KZN leaders, uh, mm. said that by the time we go to the elections, uh, President Zuma will be or, or, or in, hospital. in hospital. That was one. I think he meant, uh, I think he did mean because of the results, but but he, he, anyway, continue, yeah. I will continue. Then about five days later, uh, from today, five days from today, uh, Solima Paila was in mm. a newsroom Africa speaking to Tabum Zuli. And he said, "What what Jacob Zuma is doing is is is, is uh, some kind some kind of a, a counter revolution. And if we were in the trenches, those who were in the mm. in the trenches knows exactly what to do yeah. to a person who has done that. Then uh, a, a day after, the president is getting into an accident, no. right? Now, now after that, after that, what happened? That in Johannesburg, one of the MECs is is is, is, is taking down all. Uh, I mean, the boards of the MK. Um, uh, 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 Were they? Uh, oh, yes. And 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 today we're working upon the story that in Bluff here in Deben, in Tara Road, all the MK pamphlet has been destroyed. Mm. Now, now, if someone says that this thing, we, we, uh, I mean, we're not supposed to look at these things. Honestly, mm. I don't know what are you trying mm. to do because he, what I can tell you, Stephen, is that there are boards for the ANC where we are living. There are the boards for for DA where mm. we are living. Should we do the same? No. I think the I I say we should 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 take a. a, a standard, I'm not I'm a, a, I'm not aware, and I can't find anything on Google quickly, Muzi, of a, of an MEC taking down billboards. But it is illegal. You're not allowed to take down someone else's it, posters. It, it is happening. It happened. This all this thing happened with, within this weekend. And in plus today, you can go to Tara Road mm-hmm. and you'll see only only MK uh, pamphlet has been destroyed. Totally, okay. totally destroyed. Okay. But and mu- I, I'm but telling mu- you, Stephen, if, mm. if, if 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 any of of a uh, political party these boards are being destroyed in the places where we are living. It's going to be look like it's MK members who are, are, are revenging to those mm. people. Sure. Now, now I think IEC should 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 do something about it, and the, the, uh, mm. uh, the, the DA members because that word is a DA led mm. word, mm. and uh, we really do. Don't like to to find ourselves in a situation sure. where we have sure. to come and answer as if we are retaliating. Yeah, it goes in lots of directions. Because I mean, if I were to argue for a second the other way, I mean, the main campaigner for MK, his song is about a machine gun, <laughs> you know. And I mean, people have become used to that over the years. I mean, it goes in lots of directions, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does lots of directions. But mm. now this is personal. This is this, this is a a. a Mkondo was a president who was in an accident. And if yeah. police don't think that uh, they should go in and investigate this, and, and it's going to go mm. a long way, because mm. this is the president of a political party. If this thing happened to uh, John Stein Hazen, mm. a president of uh, DA, or it happened to uh, the president of the ANC, Cyril Ramaphosa, I don't think that the minister of police would have spoken the way he has spoken about what needs to be done. Mm. This thing needs to be investigated, and we need to, uh, people to come on the book. All right, Muzi, in case of then, let's see. I, I agree with you. There needs to be an investigation. Uh, Papillion I, from Eldorado Park, Etos. Hi, Papillion. Hi, my friend. How are you? Yeah, I'm a while. It's been a long time. Go for it. Mm, wonderful, wonderful. You know, um, in fact, we are so ecstatic concerning the the um, obliteration of Etos, but yeah. that's not my topic. What I would like to know, please, John, is how much, in fact, how did everything originate concerning Etos, number one? Number mm. two, how much was made concerning everything which was the purpose of it? Number three, 
how much was paid off and how much is still owing because I can tell you now, okay. John, you know, I tell you, you know, it's a headache and we can go from from toilet to post. Mm. We will not find the answer to such. Yeah, I think, but Pillion, if you if you spend some time looking at Sanral, and I mean, I know, for example, the Gauteng government, I think, has to, has to give over twelve point seven billion rand. So times mm. that by three, because that's one th- that's one third. Um, and I think you will. I think if you look around, I think you will find it. It'll be in it'll be in Sanral's annual reports and things like that. I'm sure, Papillion. I mean, I know you. I know why you say that, but I think yes, a little yes, bit of digging, you'll find it. Yeah. Oh, well, thank yeah. you very much. Really appreciate it. Sure. Huh? All right, thanks, Papillon. I appreciate it. Gift on the line from the Eastern Cape, and just a reminder, Gift is also a spokesperson for the ANC in the Eastern Cape. <laughs> Gift, <laughs> Gift. I have to remind people each time. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, Stephen. You like that disclaimer? Well, <laughs> I know, I know to... that I've not been on the radio for the past two years. I had a bereavement. Oh, I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry, Gift. Just I'm sorry. Just that yeah. disclaimer, Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> Even if I express the views, I know that I always have that disclaimer. But quickly, Stephen, I think uh, for starters, I was listening to the spokesperson of the Zuma and Party. And and Clela, yeah. On, on, yeah. Yeah, on your show. And every time when I listen to this man, I always laugh because... One of the things that he has raised, in fact, um, I think, let me say this, I think those guys from the Zuma party believes in, in conspiracy theories, David. Uh, you could hear the previous caller, I think Musi, is also living in the food paradise. Look, we, we know, you know, and every South African who can think knows very well that uh, Section 47 mm-hmm. of the country's constitution bars any citizen who who has committed a crime, who has mm. uh, an offence and was sentenced to imprisonment for more than 12 months uh, without an option of a fine. And this does not need... In, uh, in the last five uh, years, yes. Yes, no, no, I agree. Yeah. And this does not need uh, someone to, to have a degree to understand that. Yeah. It's just written in the country's constitution. Even my 11-year-old son reads the country's constitution. He mm. knows that very well. Mm. And and they know very well that uh, this provision, Stephen, renders Zuma... Uh, to be described, to be on the mm. list of, 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 of a party, including the NK party. And and I don't know why these guys uh, still believe that uh, Zuma is going to be on the, on, mm. on the ballot. But strangely, strangely, Stephen, I was going through uh, some opinion uh, uh, pieces, and one opinion piece was written by that Paul Gobeni. You, you recall Paul Gobeni, Stephen? Uh, yes, yes. He says he's an attorney, uh, but he's not, yeah. Zuma, that's, yeah, that's Zuma Loyalist, mm, who's, yeah. who's also say, who also claims that he's a legal analyst. He wrote something uh, titled, in fact, he wrote an opinion piece titled, Does the IC, uh, uh, does the IC's pronouncement on the Zuma uh, poses an alarm about our constitutional competence, in fact, about its constitutional competence and, and independence? And if, if you go through that article, look, I'm not a writer or, or mm. the author of that article. He's the, he's the author. But if you go through that uh, opinion piece, He's making a lot of insinuations mm. about the IEC, including its stuff. And I think I'll, I'll invite this mm. uh, Zuma Loyalist to your show so that we can engage mm, yeah. him. Uh, because there's a lot of rubbish that he wrote on that uh, opinion mm. piece that need to be engaged on. But right. most importantly, I think those uh, guys from the Zuma party mm. lives in a fool's paradise and think that South Africans are just mm. fools. All right, gift on the line from the Eastern Cape. Let's see. Uh, obviously, we'll wait for the electoral court to, to make some decisions. Prophet OJ and Mahakeng, hi. Good morning. Food prices. Uh, good morning, Steve. I'm saved by the blood of God, Jesus Christ. If you remember, Steve, uh, since you recorded my uh, uh, what you call comments, uh, my key comment has always been that uh, South Africa lacks in community. I, I lacks, sorry, one. lacks what? Economic vision. Oh, economic, economic vision. vision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I said to you the other day that as much as South Africans met at Cape Town in 1955 uh, to draw the Freedom Charter, they were supposed, after 1994, immediately after 1990, they were supposed to converge in the same manner now to pave the way for the economic uh, mm-hmm. uh, path of the land. Unfortunately, they never did. Mm. So as a result, these things of food ha- food prices hikes and uh, the problems South Africa is, 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 is uh, facing now are really rooted in the fact that we do not have an economic vision. Go to any university and, and crap any the one of yeah. the students who do commercials. Ask that student what is the vision of mm. this country. 
I can tell you, you won't get the answer. Yeah. Go to the president of South Africa right now, President Matana Ramaphosa. Just crap him and ask him, President, just clearly in one sentence, mm. what is the, the, the vision of South Africa economically? He will tell you about China, he will tell you about yeah. Australia, he will tell you. He won't definitely tell you what is it that South Africa has okay. as an economic vision. So as a result, uh, uh, what they what, what the normally say is that uh, we, 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 we are the product of what is happening inter- sure. uh, internationally. Sure. I, I'm saying it does not matter what is happening. Inter- I, I, I am myself, uh, uh, Steve, you are Steve, I'm OJ. Uh, you, you cannot copy always from me. You yeah. have got to have something which I can see in you, which okay. is unique. South Africa is unique economically, but we do not we do not want to see that because we are blinded okay. by the fact that we always want to copy from international community on how to do our things economically. All right, Prophet OJ, thank you. Interesting idea, but uh, economic vision, sure. Twenty three after eight. At SFM Radio and at Stephen Grutus on Twitter. Well, it seems that there's a big dispute between the employers of South Africa's rugby players uh, and that everyone could lose around 300 million rand because of the timing of the Curry Cup. And what's happened is the Vodacom URC is being played in the time when the Curry Cup was being played. So where do you fit the Curry Cup? And of course, the rugby players are supposed to have a certain amount of time of year for their bodies to heal. Heinz Skenk is a senior sports writer at Sports 24. For news. Heinz, good morning. Good morning, Stephen. Um, is this the kind of typical industrial dispute where people are saying, oh, we might not have a curry cup this year because they're raising the bar for negotiations, or is it actually real? Um, Stephen, it's an interesting one. This um, There seems to actually be a bit of a divide. Um, to be honest, that's starting to grow here. Um, what we've gathered so far from correspondence and what you know stakeholders have told us is that this is actually all player driven, to be honest. My players, the players organization is um, actually driving this. Um, and meanwhile, like you said, the, the employers, which are the 14 provincial unions, they want to play and obviously SA Rugby want to play. Um, so it, it's definitely yeah, just basically a dispute between the players, my players who represent them, and the unions. But what's starting to emerge now also, Stephen, is that one has to remember that you have um, teams like the Pumas and Griquas and to a lesser extent the Cheetah. Heinz, are you still with us? Uh, who are actually... And um, they are... Do you hear me? Yeah, we can. Go on. Okay, cool. So all I wanted to say, Stephen, is that um, there's there's now sort of like a divide between the URC franchise players and the Pumas and the Cheetahs and Greekwas who do not play in the URC. And those three franchises are um, very dependent on the Cup. It's their main source of income and the main uh, Mike actually didn't even really consult them because they're sort of like in the dark as well. So it seems it seems at the moment that it's actually the big unions as mm-hmm. players who are actually driving this whole dispute. Okay, I mean, is there any way to resolve it? And I mean, it's all about time and resources, the usual problems of managing of managing a company. It's managing time and resources. Is there any way to really resolve it that you can see? The Unfortunately, we're not uh, able to continue with that conversation. Heinz Schenk is a senior sports writer at Sports 24 News. Sorry about that. Just uh, one of those things. Uh, coming up in the next little while, we will, of course, be talking uh, uh, a lot more about cigarettes and illicit cigarettes. It's amazing some of the numbers that you see in terms of illicit cigarettes. Really just incredible. We'll, we'll look at that now and we'll see also how it's affecting the formal industry and, of course, the big impact it's going to be happening on government as well. So we'll look at that in the next little while. You with us, FM coming up now to 27 minutes after 8 o'clock. This is SAFM Sport with Zai Khan. Zai, good morning, Banyana Banyana. Crunch Olympic qualifier on the horizon. Coach Desiree Ellis insisting experience will count in their final hurdle. They'll take on Nigeria. Now, Banyana arrived on Sunday in Abuja. That's for the first leg clash against the Super Falcons, which will be played at the MKO Abiola National Stadium on the 5th of April, before the return leg will happen at Loftus Farsfield Stadium 
Stadium in Pretoria on the 9th of April. The final Banyana squad will also include 23-year-old Figile Magaba of the University of Western Cape and 19-year-old Intabising Magia, who recently signed with Mamaluri Sundowns Ladies. Coach Ellis says she needs a mix of experience and youth to give the team more. We stood up, but we also have that enthusiasm of youth. Um, and I think that is what we needed to get right, get that mix right. You have um, Karabu Lamini, you have Tabi Singh Magia, you have Fikili Magama, you know, you have Sinotolo and, and, and um, not, not Tolo. you have, you know, those players coming coming through. And I think that that for us was really important to get that mix right as well because you can have the experience, but you also need a little bit of, of youth to give you that freshness, to give you, um, you know, um, the the... The enthusiasm when when you need them. Moving on to rugby now, the Lions had a 21-36 loss to Ospreys in the United Rugby Championship over the weekend. It dashed their hopes of a URC playoff and they slipped out of the top eight. They now switch to the Challenge Cup and travel to Italy where they'll face Benetton, a side brimming with confidence and sitting at the top of Pool 2 after three wins from four outings. Lions number 8, Frank Horn, views the upcoming fixture against Benetton as another opportunity to bounce back. Playing Benetton, it's a it's a other competition. It's a knockout rugby, so um, you know it's something uh, new to look forward to. Um, and uh, we'll just focus on ourselves, be better, um, like we know we can be, um, and then um, take it from there. But I have no doubts that the guys will will get together. Um, we'll go and check what we what we did wrong and and what we can do. The opportunities against Benetton and then try and exploit that and, and do that on Saturday. Let's go to Athletic South Africa. Half marathon and 10 kilometer champion Glen Rose Taba has kicked off her season by successfully defending her national 10 kilometer title and winning the Cape Town leg of the Spa Women's 10 kilometer challenge. Now, Taba is set to compete in numerous races throughout the year, but she wants to dedicate herself to extensive training for the 10,000 meters to secure qualifications for the Olympic Games in Paris and in July and August. You know, I don't like to disclose my plans, but we're going to try mid this year to go for 10,000 meters um, night of PB to at least uh, try to run a better time. Maybe we can get 31, maybe we can get 30 the way she is now. So we're going to try to run 10,000 meters in Sierra. And we, we are praying and we are hoping that maybe we will come to certain spa ladies races but our our aim is to focus on the 10,000 meters because she ran two weeks back she, uh, two weeks back she ran at 32.04 in in Pretoria agent so it shows that we, we might have a good time that's a wrap of your sport on Sunrise. More coming up here on SFM around half past 12. I'm Zai Khan Zai thanks very much indeed you're with SFM leading the conversation 8.30 Thank you, Stephen. In your headlines, Police Minister Peggy Tsele, together with the National Police Commissioner Fani Masemula, are expected to attend the court case of the 15 suspects who have been arrested in connection with the murder cases at the University of Fort Hare in the Eastern Cape. The suspects will make their first appearance before the Dimbaza Magistrates Court today. A Durban Metro Police officer who allegedly stabbed his girlfriend to death is expected to make his first appearance before the Durban Magistrates Court today. The 27 year old suspect who is in police custody allegedly stabbed his girlfriend inside a flat in the Durban CBD at the weekend. And Japan says it will lift its suspension of funding to the UN Palestinian Refugee Agency UNRWA as the relief body works to regain trust after an allegation by Israel that some of its staff were involved in the October 7th attacks on Israel. Tokyo and 15 other countries suspended millions of dollars in funding earlier this year while the agency conducted an investigation into the allegation. I'll have details on these and other stories at 9. 
SAFM. Guiding you through the rush hour traffic. It's just worth noting the M1 between Pretoria and Joburg is slower than you might be expecting without any sort of incident um, to get in the way. For example, uh, coming through from Pretoria, Kaasfontein down to right down to the R21 is uh, quite slow. And then from Brockfontein down to New Road stays busy as well. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a bit of late returning holiday, long weekend traffic uh, in that mix this morning. It is unusually busy. N1 north up to William Mandela, slow in the N1 from Ravonia, uh, moving through to the clue is under pressure. And don't forget the roadworks, R21 approaching Clayville. That's quite a heavy back. Backlog this morning en route towards the airport. Earlier crash on the Mike 1 uh, going north at Smith Street appears to be cleared, but the Mike 1 coming through from Boyce and stays heavy. Uh, a couple of crash scenes around Durban, the Higginson Highway at Bayview, leaving Chatsworth still slow, and a truck crash on the R102, just up by JG Champion uh, in the uh, Palmview area. So if you're moving between Phoenix and Verulam, uh, that R102 route is under quite a bit of pressure. Uh, Cape Town things coming down, a crash on the N2 inbound at the M5 is being cleared. Uh, Govan and Becky is very slow this morning for motors coming out of Nyanga on the way through to sort of lands down at Claremont. That uh, run through Hanover Park towards Jan Smuts Drive uh, on Govan and Becky going west is all backed up. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. Unforgettable happens when the young and the old know they can surf, snorkel, fish, enjoy whale watching and end the day with sundowners near Shisanyama. KwaZulu Natal is a jaw waiting to happen. Ziakipa. With hiking, horse riding, biking, zip lining and mountain biking adventures. Waiting for the fearless and the bold. Unforgettable happens here. Zwagana. Brought to you by Tourism KwaZulu Natal. Saturday nights on S3 are about to get dramatic. Tune into The Player at 9.30pm and catch Wesley Snipes as a pit boss as he and his team gamble on the ability of security expert Philip Winchester to stop some of the biggest crimes imaginable from playing out. Can he take them down from the inside and get revenge for the death of his wife? Or is it true what they say? The house always wins. Channel your best drama with The Player, Saturdays at 9.30pm, only on S3. Gau Dream is for the legends who make moves to save and pay from as little as 45 rand from Pretoria to Midrand. It's for our clever who turn 5-litre bottles into workout dumbbells. And for the Slim Oaks who bring a home-cooked scuff team to work every day. So when it comes to travel, make moves that save and pay from as little as 45 rand from Pretoria to Midrand Station. Gau Train, for people on the move. Attention filmmakers, are you ready? It's time to showcase the vibrant tapestry of KZN's cultural heritage at the Simon Mabuno Sabela KZN Film and Television Awards, South Africa's ultimate celebration of cinematic excellence. In partnership with the SABC and KZN EDTA, we champion innovation, paving the way for the future of cinema. This year, we go beyond imagination. Cut, edit your one-minute submissions because a call for entries is now open until the 28th of March, 2024. For more information, visit www.kzn.com www.kzenfilm.co.za or follow us on our social platforms. Join the conversation using hashtag SSA24. KZN Film, our kingdom is your stage. Mediated Conversation on SAFM. 25 minutes now to nine. Time for your Mediated Conversation this Tuesday morning. There's now new research that suggests the amount of money our government is losing through the sale of illicit cigarettes is 17 billion rand a year, or around that figure. Perhaps even more scary is the claim that the illicit trade in the cigarette market was well over 60% of the total cigarette market last year. In other words, six out of 10 cigarettes sold were sold illegally. There are important reasons why this is happening, in that the amount of excise tax on each packet of cigarettes is 21 rand and 77 cents. This is a tax that is charged as the cigarettes are produced and before they are sold. When they are sold, VAT is charged on them too, which means illicit cigarettes are produced and sold, that when this happens, government loses out twice. At the same time, by the way, in 2022, it's believed smoking killed over 31,000 people in South Africa, a reminder that smoking really does kill. So then, how has the solicit economy got so big? What impact does it have on government and on the legal industry? First this morning, Professor Corne van Velpix, a professor of economics and director of the research unit on the economics of excisable products at the University of Cape Town. Then, the impact on the formal economy. Johnny Maloto is the general manager at British American Tobacco 
SA. Simon Pluntlam Guni is the chair at the Fair Trade Independent Tobacco Association. And what is going on in the industry and what's happening with the rates of smoking? Dr. Sharon Inyatsanza is at the National Council Against Smoking. We start then with Professor Corne van, Vel- Corne Vel- van Velkbeek. Professor van Velkbeek, good morning and thank you for your time. Good morning, Stephen, and thank you for having me on your show. As I understand your research, in 2009, just 5% of cigarettes were sold illegally. Just 5%. What happened after that? Yes, so after 2009, uh, we see that there's been a very, very significant increase in illicit trade in South Africa. And basically what was driving that was between 1994, when uh, the government started increasing the excise taxes quite dramatically, what we see is that the uh, uh, main industry play at that point in time, it was Rembrandt, it subsequently became British American Tobacco, they started increasing the, uh, the retail price of cigarettes by substantially more than the increase in the excise tax. So basically what's happening was if the government were to say increase the excise tax by one rand, uh, BAT would then increase the retail price by two rand or even three rand. And as a result, it was greatly increasing its profit per cigarette, even though the quantity of cigarettes were dropping over that period from 1994 through to 2009. And this attracted a number of players into the market. Uh, Many of these players are subsequently under the banner of uh, FITA, the Fair Trade Independent Tobacco Association, you'll be talking to as well. And they entered into the market basically undermining the prices of uh, of British American tobacco brands. Many of these companies were also selling these cigarette brands at uh, prices that are so low that it's impossible for all the excise tax to have been paid. And what we find is that the market greatly fragmented. Also, of course, under the regime of uh, Tomoyane at the South African Revenue Services, uh, the illicit market greatly expanded during the period from 2014 through to 2018. Then during 2020, uh, we had the five-month sales ban. And this also, again, greatly increased the illicit market because desperate smokers were desperately looking around for uh, for cigarettes, and most of the cigarettes that they could find were the illicit brands. And after the um, the sales ban was lifted, many of these smokers, our research shows, actually stayed with the uh, brands that they were smoking during the sales ban period. So in uh, all in all, it was a confluence of a number of different things and, of course, a very, very poor uh, record of um, uh, just controlling the illicit market. We just have not had the control of the illicit market that we should be having uh, in South Africa, uh, and that resulted in this very, very large illicit market as we have it right now. Is it possible to know who's making money out of this? I mean, clearly someone is. It's a big industry. Yeah, so uh, we don't have the exact numbers over there, but what we certainly do know from the COVID experience is that the smaller companies were the ones making uh, a lot of money during this period. And I think it's fair to say that the whole, uh, all tobacco companies are benefiting from illicit trade. Some, of course, much more than others. Okay. So, so even British American tobacco benefits from illicit trade. Is that what you mean? I would, uh, well, uh, it will probably be denied vehemently, but uh, this, uh, the evidence is very, very strong to suggest that even legal companies and even Formal companies like BAT uh, have benefited significantly from illicit trade. We saw that a lot of uh, cigarettes were sold during the illicit, or during the sales ban period in 2020, and a substantial proportion, although certainly not the majority, but a substantial proportion of them were from BAT brands. How important was the total ban on cigarettes during the lockdown of the pandemic? I mean, I realize what had happened with Tom Mayani when he was in charge at SARS and weakened SARS deliberately as the findings have it. But during the lockdown of the pandemic, that total ban, how significant was that? Yeah, so during the ban, and it lasted five months, uh, all cigarettes that were sold during that period by definition were illicit because sales uh, were completely disallowed during that period. Before 2020, the illicit market was probably in the order of about 35 to 40 percent. Uh, at the moment and during 2020 and subsequently, the illicit market has increased to close to 60 percent or even above 60 percent at the moment. So one can... Uh, sort of surmise that at least 20% of the market has increased and has become illicit as a result of 
the sales ban of 2020. One would have expected that there should be a decrease in illicit trade after 2020. We are simply not seeing that in the numbers. Professor Corne van Velkbeek, thank you very much indeed. Professor of Economics, Director of the Research Unit on the Economics of Excisable Products at the University of Cape Town. 18 minutes to nine, your mediated conversation around this continues. Jimmy Maloto is uh, the General Manager at British American Tobacco SA. Johnny, good morning and thank you for your time. Good morning, Stephen. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Do you benefit from the illicit trade in cigarettes? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, in fact, we're at the forefront of making sure we call for uh, instruments such as the production counters and CCTV monitor- monitoring at our factories. And a couple of times we've extended the invitation to SARS and all the other law enforcement authorities to come and place enforcers at our factories to make sure that every stick that is produced is actually declared. So we reject that vehemently. That's not accurate. When excise taxes were being put up on cigarettes after 1994, why did you increase the price of a cigarette uh, so significantly? Obviously, you made a higher profit, but wasn't there always going to be the consequence of a greater illicit industry? Yeah. So, Stephen, I mean, I think there is some like, some misconception around that. Remember, we have always, as uh, Professor Van Barbe correctly pointed out, that uh, we were always a bigger player, but we've always played in the premium space. We never sold anything in the uh, low uh, value segment of the market. It's only once the illicit players started coming uh, in 2010, thereabouts, that you started to see a, see a shift in the market. But for us, as a bigger company, all of it also has to do with the cost of, do, of doing business. So in terms of making sure that we remain uh, sustainable as a business, in the premium segment, we needed to make sure that we pay priced accordingly. And just to correct, Stephen, um, I think uh, the profit, uh, you had an older number on excise. The latest excise is 25 cents and 4 cents so that we shape the conservation accordingly. Okay, I appreciate that. So you then are losing out because of the illicit industry. How much are you losing? So we've lost about, uh, we say in our statement, about 40% of our volume is actually quite more because... In 2019, we were sitting at about 12.9 billion sticks. Uh, last year alone, we reduced by half. Um, this isn't because people have stopped smoking? No, actually, it, if anything, uh, uh, smoking incidence has increased rather than declined. So it's not that people have smoked, smoked, stopped smoking. Uh, I think the availability of very, very cheap cigarettes, as cheap as 5 and 70, has been largely a stimulus to this, where uh, people can now afford uh, cigarettes rather than uh, what uh, exercise was intended to do uh, to uh, actually st- uh, stop people from consuming the product. And not only that, of course, we know that enforcement is very poor in this country. Okay. I mean, you said you, you made the point that you'd always focused on the premium end of the market. You're not mm-hmm. going to go down market to try and compete. Uh, we do have products that, uh, uh, I mean, that sell at that level, but even, even products that sell at the lowest uh, price point, uh, you could not po- compete with anything that sells below 32 rands. At the moment, we have, as I say, brands that sell as cheap as 5 rands of energy. Uh, without, uh, that's clearly exercise not being paid when exercise is sitting as 25 rand of 4. So you could not, if you add on to that production cost, distribution cost, and all your other costs, it's impossible to, co- to sell profitably at an amount less than 32 rand. Okay. If this continues, could we end up with an illicit industry that essentially removes the formal industry? That, that is possible, yeah. In other words, you'll just disappear and it'll all be illegal? Yeah. Well, if government doesn't do anything to uh, ensure that we see a, 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 a tremendous trend change, uh, by a trend change we mean like at least a 5 to 10% of decrease uh, in illicit trade year on year, then we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's all the way down. down the way. If you look from 2019, it's just been all the way uh, uh, downward trend in terms of the legal market and illicit has just shot up. Johnny Maloto, thank you. General Manager at British American Tobacco SA. You were there, SAFM, continuing your mediated conversation around how the rise of illicit tobacco, in other words, cigarettes that are manufactured and which proper tax is not paid. It's an excise tax. When you make cigarettes, you actually pay the tax as you produce them before they're sold. So we're talking essentially about cigarettes that are made illegally and sold illegally because the tax hasn't been paid on them. Sanantlant Lam Guni is the chair of the Fair Trade Independent Tobacco Association. Good morning. Thanks for your time.
Morning, Stephen. Thank you for having me on your show. Sure. Do all of your members pay the full tax they're supposed to pay on the cigarettes that they make and sell? Definitely. That's that's something without any doubt that I, I have to say yes. So definitely, absolutely, you say that hand on your heart? Definitely. I mean, there's been no evidence whatsoever that any of my members have been found to have won and foul of, of the tax laws. In fact, I think that question should have been posed to Johnny rather than us. <laughs> okay. Well, he also denied benefiting from the illicit trade. Why do you believe the illicit trade in cigarettes is so big? Look, I think, I think the, 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 the primary issue is that uh, government's efforts have moved away from, for instance, if you look at how Project Honey Badger um, during the years 2012 to 2014 looked at the industry holistically instead of putting an inordinate focus on one type of uh, compliance risk along the value chain. Um, you find that if you look at reports, for instance, that were put forward before the Nugent Commission, um, non-compliance was quite low during those years when Honey Badger was in place. Whereas if you look at what happened thereafter, where, for instance, in the Moyani years, non-compliance went up because of how um, SARS used to combat the illicit trade, a focus inordinately on smuggling and, and non-compliance by some manufacturers. You, you, you sort of get a, a, an understanding that there's a lack of capacity and uh, a know-how on how to deal with, with the um, illicit trade as a whole along the value chain. Um, you see, for instance, that the, the issue of smuggling currently, which is quite a huge uh, contributor to the illicit trade, is not being contained, whereas, for instance, um, non-compliance by local manufacturers, there's been quite a lot of interventions that have been put into place there. So you're sort of plugging one hole, but you're letting go of a whole host of other holes which have not been looked at. If you look at, for instance, base erosion and profit shifting, that has not been looked at by the current administration, whereas it was considered uh, as quite a big contributor to the illicit trade during the years of Project Honey Badger. So it, it, it's just a failure by the revenue service to look at the non-compliance in the industry holistically. Okay, so it's SARS, but it's more than SARS. It's surely the police, it's the people who are supposed of to course. monitor our borders, all of that. Of course, and, and that's something that we've advocated, Stephen. We've said that there needs to be a sort of talking to each other between the various law enforcement agencies. I mean, you have, for instance, I mean, I raise smuggling because it's quite prevalent at this point, but um, factories that are popping up in all our various neighboring countries, and surely that should then be something that the not only the revenue service via customs, but also um, the, the police service and potentially even the border management authority should be tackling. Um, you also have what I call a, a capacity issue in as far as the understanding of what an illicit cigarette is. Um, I deal in my capacity as an attorney uh, quite, quite substantially with, um, with police officers, and you get the understanding or the feeling rather that there is no understanding of what the illicit cigarette is. And I think that a lot more could be done to capacitate the various law enforcement agencies and, and to ensure that there's a better understanding so that the issue can be dealt with more effectively. Senator Tlantla Nguni, thank you very much indeed, Chair of the Fair Trade Independent Tobacco Association. In a moment, your mediated conversation will continue with Dr. Sharon Eniat Sanza from the National Council Against Smoking. Ten minutes to nine. AFM. Guiding you through the rush hour traffic. A little bit of traffic in Pretoria. CBD reports coming through of a building on fire on Pretorius near uh, Paul Kruger. So we're sort of talking uh, really central uh, Pretoria CBD. Uh, there is a little bit of traffic congestion around that area. Uh, the N1 staying busy between the old Joburg Road and the New Road. No obstruction, just a, a pure pressure of traffic. And there are some delays routing through Baclue interchange today. Uh, the N1 from Ravonia, the N3 from Limbro Park. Uh, both of those highways fairly busy and slow into the clue. Uh, looks like the issues as you come off those are highway ramps and uh, want to turn on to the M1 north towards Midrad. R21 passing the St George's Hotel uh, down towards Oliphant's Fontaine remains heavy due to roadworks. Make sure you've got plenty of time to get through that uh, if you've got a flight to connect with. And the bike one from Boyson's moving slow uh, through to about Empire Road before you're out of that congestion this morning. That's unusually slow uh, for this time of day. Over in uh, Durban, things clearing up quite nicely. The crash at Verulam on the R102 is out of the way. Higginson Highway at Chatsworth uh, that collision scene finally clear.
clear the way. And the highway networks around Durban uh, looking OK. Cape Town, a crash in front of Lunga on the N2 inbound by Bunga Avenue. That's quite slow coming through from the N7. And Govan and Becky is very heavy this morning in the Hanover Park area. That's causing a delay for motorists that are driving from the Unger uh, direction Lansdowne and Claremont. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. Mediated Conversation on SAFM. Nine minutes to nine the time. Continuing your Mediated Conversation this morning with Dr. Sharon in the the National Council Against Smoking. Continuing, of course, around the illicit tobacco economy, which we've seen. Dr. Nyatsanza, good morning. Morning, Stephen. We've had quite a lot of denials this morning uh, from formal organizations and companies who say they don't benefit from illicit cigarettes. Uh, can I believe the denials? I'd like to. Uh, so when tobacco companies typically asked whether tobacco would kill people or whether it would be addictive, they said no. <laughs> they sworn before the court and said no. And right now, as you saw, when you're asking even the big players and the small players, both of them blame each other. They'll, they'll say no. And usually, you know, even people say you can't have a cake and eat it. But in terms of the tobacco companies and this trade, they have been able to have the cake and actually eat it. We know, for example, during the COVID ban that they were allowed to manufacture and that those same cigarettes actually were flooding the illicit market. We know that there have been reports in 2020 showing that 66% of all cigarettes exported, much for exports, actually never reached the destination. So no, definitely, as Corne was saying, the industry is benefiting. It is either involved, it's complicit in this trade. And I think, yes, the problem is SARS, yes, the problem is compliance, etc. But the industry also is at the heart of the problem. Okay, you say that, but I mean, you know, we see from from um, from British American Tobacco, for example, they're complaining that they're going to have to cut jobs over this, that they're going to basically lose a huge amount of money. I mean, would a company really do that? The BT definitely would actually do that. It would say it's not benefiting, it would cut jobs when actually it is actually declaring profit every year. I would say, yes, they actually would do that, David. Okay. Um, what kind of response does government need to bring? And, uh, and this is very difficult. Um, you've got to try and enforce complicated laws. You're trying to stop people from buying single sticks of cigarettes. These are people who want to smoke. They're addicted. The cigarettes are freely available. It doesn't cost much money. You buy them at a traffic light. Very difficult to stop that. Definitely, as you were talking about, you know, the harms, you know, the case for tobacco has already been made. You already mentioned, for example, that we lose $42 billion each and every year from treating the tobacco less illness from premature death, etc. And that really is a big amount of money. But I guess it doesn't really make much of media sensation. That's why we don't get so much as well of, um, you know, spotlight on the just the harms from tobacco itself. But we know, as Professor Kone already has been reiterating, they need to secure the supply chain. And obviously, I think he's also already just made it clear that there are no links between illicit trade and tobacco control laws. Actually, the evidence that we have in South Africa is quite the opposite. There really is no links. When we had uh, very good laws, when we had very high taxes, we had very, very low illicit trade. And I think in 2021, yeah, 2021, the Committee on Finance actually made recommendations to ensure that Treasury and SARS come back to, to that committee to report on where they are with the check and trace, where they are with actually ratifying the illicit trade protocol. And that is actually what we need. We need transparency. We need to know exactly what steps are being taken to actually tackle the problem of illicit trade and tackle the problem of tobacco as a, actually comprehensively. Because actually... Um, not much is being done at this stage. And it is a little bit frustrating because the case for tobacco has been made. There's no benefit on all sides. SARS has reformed, I mean, fundamentally, I think we'll see their revenue figures out today. Um, do you believe that they're doing what they can to try and stop the illicit trade? So definitely, for example, I, I think they, there's been investments, there's been, I think, reports on how much they, for example, put through TVs, but that is not enough. That is what we're saying from our side, from public health. That is not enough. It needs to be a comprehensive approach. You really need to secure the supply chain. And one of the ways you do that is to ensure that you don't involve the tobacco companies. I think we saw what happened in the previous years when they were part of the you know, illicit trade task force. Instead of actually helping SARS, they actually were just trying to crush down competitors. 
So much more needs to be done to secure the supply chain. There needs to be really, and it has to be urgent because already we see that the problem is getting bigger and bigger. More and more people actually are smoking. And I think when you talk about smoking as well, it becomes even more complex because we see, for example, bubbly bubbly uses on the rise, rolling on cigarettes as well are on the rise. And all these effects actually have a role to play when we, you know, when we determine how much is illicit trade, when we determine how much people actually are smoking. Um, so then other campaigns to try and stop people smoking, are they just failing then, simply because cigarettes are too cheap? So definitely illicit trade actually undermines the public, pub, the public health objectives because the campaigns are there, yes. For example, right now we're advocating for a tobacco control bill uh, for it to be passed because we know, for example, that we have products that are like vapes, which are now over 15 years in the market with no regulations at all. So all these are needed. But what we see from the case of illicit trade and from the case of tobacco, something that's very clear is that the tobacco problem is not a health-only problem. It needs a whole-of-government approach. It can't be only, for example, the Minister of Health trying to put, push legislation. SARS, Treasury also has to come in to ensure that you know, tax administration is done properly. So it cannot be done. It can't be a piecemeal approach. What we're seeing is that it has to be actually a comprehensive approach for us to deal you know, decisively with, with the problem of tobacco in South Africa. It also means, for example, you'd have to secure borders. You'd have to work with other countries. Those are all difficult things to do. Definitely, all those things actually, you know, are very important. But even if you look at um, the evidence in South Africa, studies that were, were, were published by, by, by REAP, also even SARS, they've already stated that the majority of the problem with illicit trade in South Africa is mainly undeclared local production. That really is the major part of the problem. We're not saying that there are no smuggled products. Yes, there are smuggled products, but the majority of the problem actually is just unpaid tax. And that is really what we are, you know, we are saying SARS needs to, you know, pull up the socks and ensure that the supply chain is secured. Okay, so it's about all of those things. That requires an awful lot of money, but we'll get a lot of money back because there'll be a lot more revenue. It will, be, it will be much more revenue. And if you actually compare the figures, it doesn't cost a lot of money. Because we're already saying in 2016 alone, $42 billion was lost to the economy from treating tobacco related diseases from premature deaths. And if you compare that, I think there were around $14 billion of taxes that were brought in, meaning for every one rand that government gained from tobacco, they had to actually lose more than three rand just to deal with the detrimental effects. So obviously, securing the border, you know, improve, strengthening the, the, the supply chain, ensuring that we have, you know, tobacco control bill gets passed. It, when you compare to the losses of the tobacco, you know, the tobacco effects on economy, on health, on environment, it doesn't cost a lot of money. Ew. Dr. Sharon Inyatsanza, thank you very much indeed. Really appreciate it from the National Council Against Smoking. My thanks also to Sinan Tlantlamguni, chair of the Fair Trade Independent Tobacco Association. Johnny Maloto is the general manager for British American Tobacco. And starting us off today, Professor Kornel van Vilpiek is the professor of economics, director of the research unit on the economics of excisable products at the University of Cape Town. Really appreciate the time. All right, well, a lot more to come. Cathy, of course, will be with you. She will be next. There'll be ultra up later as well. Uh, there's a lot more to come, of course, here on SA. FM. We will see you tomorrow from Mdu, from Mpo, from Stanza. Melissa, myself, look after yourself. You're with SFM leading the conversation. Good morning. It's Tuesday morning. It's nine o'clock. Thank you, Stephen. In your top stories, 15 suspects to appear in court over the Fort Hare murders and a city police officer due in court for allegedly killing his girlfriend. This is SAFM News. A very good morning. I am Luanda Maume. Police Minister Peggy Kele, together with the National Police Commissioner Fani Masemula, are expected to attend the court case of the 15 suspects who have been arrested in connection with the murder cases at the University of Fort Hare in the Eastern Cape. The suspects will make their first appearance before the Timbatsa Magistrates Court today. The suspects have been arrested in connection with the killing of Vice Chancellor Zaporigat Mboneli Vesele and the university's fleet manager Petrus Roots. They are facing a string of charges such as fraud, kidnapping, murder and attempted murder. 
A Deben Metro police officer who allegedly stabbed his girlfriend to death is expected to make his first appearance before the Deben Magistrates Court today. The victim was also a Metro police officer. The 27-year-old suspect who is in police custody allegedly stabbed his girlfriend inside a flat in the Deben CBD at the weekend. Nonjabulum Dungwa Magam reports. According to police, the couple were believed to be drinking alcohol when the man allegedly stabbed the woman to death. It is also reported that the suspect then took videos and pictures of the victim taking her last breath and sent this to several people and posted on social media. For SABC News, I'm Nonjabulom Tungamakamu in Durban. In your election-related news now, Rais Mzansi will today stage a picket outside the offices of the Labour Department in Pretoria as part of its election campaign. The picket is aimed at demanding jobs and employment opportunities for individuals over the age of 35. The political party says after its engagement with different communities across the country, it has realized that one of their major concerns is lack of jobs. Rais Mzansi leader is Songa Zozibi. The only way to solve this ageism problem is to not have it. Just remove the rules and uh, provide training opportunities to as many South Africans as possible so that those South Africans can escape the, the trap of sometimes skills-related unemployment. The listeners need to know that 89% of all unemployed people either have just metric or no metric at all. Mm. We do not solve that problem by saying if you're over 35, eh, you shouldn't get a job. To the story now, Kimberley fishermen who fish in the Orange and Fall rivers have decried the polluted state of the water. Those who usually use the long weekend to camp along the river banks say they are currently fishing in contaminated water. These fishermen on the Orange River near Riverton say they fish to put food on the table because they don't have jobs. I came here to try my luck. I'm not an experienced person when it comes to the river and fishing, but I trust things that I will use. I will manage to catch fish. Fishing is our way to survive. Each and every day we are here, we don't get home empty-handed. Some day I go home with five fish, some day three or two. Environment Minister Barbara Creasy has lauded the work done by the Sea, Air and Mountain Special Operations Rangers in the Cape Metro. The duties of the rangers include safeguarding the visitors to the Table Mountain National Park and also to protect the environment, which entails the specialized unit to confront and go after crime syndicates. Creasy has inspected the unit at Newlands. One of the Sea members, who is commonly known as Janine, says her job is dangerous and requires a lot of discipline and special characteristics. Aside from the obvious physical fitness aspect of the job, there's a lot of discipline and respect that goes along with this. It takes a lot for an individual to decide to run towards danger as opposed Mm. to away. So we're looking for, when we recruit, we, we specifically look at people who have the characteristic of firstly caring for the environment, wanting to protect the environment, and having the discipline and the values of a ranger to be able to deal with these sorts of incidences with the respect and dignity that it deserves. And finally, Japan says it will lift its suspension of funding to the UN-Palestinian refugee agency UNRWA as the relief body works to regain trust after an allegation by Israel that some of its staff were involved in the October 7 attacks on Israel. Tokyo and 15 other countries suspended millions of dollars in funding earlier this year while the agency conducted an investigation into the allegation throwing its operations in the war-torn Gaza Strip into turmoil. Countries including Australia and Canada have since restored funding to UNRWA, the largest relief body operating in Gaza, which has been besieged by Israel since the attack. Recapping your top story, Police Minister Peggy Kale, together with the National Police Commissioner Fani Masamula are expected to attend the court case of the 15 suspects who have been arrested in connection with the murder cases at the University of Fort Hare in the Eastern Cape. For SAFM News, I am Luanda Maume. Headlines at 9.30. 
Timo Sasana on SAFM. Are you a small business or cooperative looking for a business loan under a million rand? SIFA can assist through the Township and Rural Entrepreneurship Program. TREP provides blended finance to various sectors facilitating participation in the economy. SIFA services are free and don't make use of private consultants. Visit sifa.org.za. SIFA is a registered credit provider. Terms and conditions apply. The Talking Point with Kathy Mosasana, weekdays 9 a.m. till midday. It was before there were the African townships like. So it. I used to live in town with my sister in a city and suburban in Johannesburg. Now, in those days, there was prohibition of liquor amongst the Africans. And there were the pass laws. And where we lived, there would be a cottage, this street, that street. And sort of back to back arrangement of houses facing that street and facing this street. And then there would be a passage, what the Africans call a khang, in between those. And the police would close one end of this and close the other end of that and start searching the houses there. Beat up people. And I mean beat them up for no reason other than that they were there and arrested people. And these were the conditions in which we lived. They forced their way into where you were. And in those conditions, we had one room. I was living with my sister and a cousin, and it was one room. And that was what everybody's experience was. And we were angry. You came out on the street. Even though we lived in town, by 11 o'clock, the police would shine a torch on your face and demand a pass. If you didn't have a pass, of course you went to jail. Now, these were the conditions in which we live. And when I listened to people like Vabasa and uh, like Sulo Petem talking about those conditions and addressing us and telling us that here was the organization to which you should be belonging as Africans, there was no problem for me. That there is the voice of Govan Mbeki, former Ravonia trialist and an anti-apartheid activist. He was accused number four in that trial. And of course, just a reminder of not only what is a bitter past that we come from. But I think so much for us to also reflect on and be grateful for as we get started with April, right? It is Freedom Month um, in South Africa. And, uh, you know, we've got Freedom Day coming up later on this month. And hopefully we'll be able to have some really meaningful reflections of what this freedom, what 30 years of this freedom actually means to us as the people of this country. What does freedom mean to you is a good place perhaps to start off the month and we'll continue looking at different aspects of this conversation as the month continues. You're listening to The Talking Point. Welcome to the show. It's not Monday, it is Tuesday, but of course we're starting off um, the week, uh, the business day, the business week rather, on Tuesday due to the Easter long weekend. I trust that uh, you have had a, a really lovely weekend. Um, of course, uh, as as, as happens um, with long weekends of this nature and public holidays, we in South Africa are also dealing with the fact that we have had so many people that have been killed on our roads. And, you know, we spoke about this a bit on, on Thursday as we're coming into the long weekend. Um, one of the worst of those accidents was the one which claimed the lives of 45 people. Um, so, yeah, our, our thoughts and prayers go to those families, right, uh, who've lost 
lost all of these people, unexpectedly so, and those um, that are also recovering in a hospital from all sorts of other injuries. Um, you know, the, the 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 bus accident that took place. The bus was traveling from uh, Botswana. There was only one survivor, an eight-year-old little girl. Uh, really, nothing short of a miracle that made it out of that particular um, accident. But I know it wasn't the only accident that took place over the weekend. And that's why I'm saying that we still have many other people that are in hospital recovering very soon. I'm sure we'll hear from the transport department just on what some of the uh, incident figures look like collectively. But it is a, a big problem that we continue to face as a country. The number of, of accidents and lives that are lost on our country's roads is really still something that um, we need to be prioritizing. Uh, did you go to church this weekend? Were you uh, perhaps at, at, a, at a service that had maybe one or two politicians there? wonder what you make of that, right? Nothing new uh, that is happening, but certainly more and more uh, politicians seem to be taking advantage of the opportunity that Easter weekend presents. I guess particularly also because, you know, we're just a couple of months away from an election. And so many leaders of, of political parties were seen at different uh, church gatherings over the weekend. Some of them even uh, given the, op the opportunity to address congregants, right? What do you make of that? Do you think that politicians should be allowed to actually speak to congregants on a Sunday? Or should that be pre the preserve of the preachers, the pastors, the reverends, whoever is leading uh, the service and perhaps the church leadership? Do you think that they should be given, you know, the microphone um, over occasions such as Easter weekend, especially in the height of an election? Because we know that much of what they'll say is obviously, it also obviously has to do um, with the election and obviously wanting to be voted for. What what do you think of that? I'd love to hear uh, some of your thoughts. Today is a Tuesday. So we are going to pick up where uh, we we left off and do what we do every Tuesday, which is uh, talking finance. Brian is out for the day. Brendan Gase will be stepping in for him in the 10 o'clock hour. And then in the final hour of the show, we'll be looking at um, our conversations really around uh, Freedom Month and 30 years of democracy. So um, how can we then begin to reflect on this 30 years and I think for today we want to start with what is the positive that we have been able to get um, out of this 30 years so where have we really made significant progress what are the things that have been afforded to us through democracy that we can all say that we appreciate um, and, and you know, we'll build on it as, as the month unfolds. So that's the conversation we'll have in the final hour of the show. Of course, it is the open line. I'll take your calls on 0614. No, that is for your WhatsApp voice notes and text messages on 0614-104-107. That's 0614-104-107. On the open line, 086 triple zero two zero three two zero eight six triple zero two zero three two one of the stories that we'll also be watching this morning will be what is coming out of the High Court um, in Gauteng and we're specifically uh, talking about the uh, the the matter around the speaker, Nosevua Mapisa Nagula. The court then will hand down its ruling today over the application that she has made to block her arrest and she wants the court to rather order that she must be summoned to court um, on these um, 12 counts of corruption and one count of money laundering that we understand um, are going to be brought against her by the National Prosecuting Authority. She does not want to be arrested. And of course, the NPA has argued that no one has a right to not be arrested, that that's not a claim. It's not a right that one can claim and that, you know, it needs to follow due process. And that due process would include also arresting um, the minister or uh, the, the speaker rather or taking her into custody and then having her appear in court like any other citizen. It is warned that um, any uh, 
other process other than what is due process. Um, if any other process is followed, then it would result in really what is a failure of our criminal justice system and create the impression that some people are treated uh, differently than others, that the law does not apply equally to all. Uh, so that's what we'll be watching unfolding in court this morning. We'll give you uh, part of that judgment or that ruling uh, as it is made. As soon as it, it becomes available, we will keep you updated on that. All right, it's a Tuesday morning. Let's kick it off then with the open line. I'm taking your calls. 086-000-2032. That's the number to dial. 086-000-2032. And on the WhatsApp voice note line 0614-104-107. Unforgettable happens when the young and the old know they can surf, snorkel, fish, enjoy whale watching and end the day with sundowners Neshisa Nyama. Guazulu Natal is a job waiting to happen. Ziakipa. With hiking, horse riding, biking, zip lining and mountain biking adventures. Waiting for the fearless and the bold. Unforgettable happens here. Zwagala. Brought to you by Tourism Guazulu Natal. Did you know that government has set a minimum amount for employers to pay their employees and workers? In 2018, the National Minimum Wage Act 09 of 2018 was passed in South Africa. It makes it compulsory for all employers to pay employees and workers a minimum wage. In 2024, the national minimum wage for all workers, including domestics, farm and forestry workers, is 27 rands 58 cents per hour. The minimum wage for workers on the expanded public works program, EPWP, is 15 rands 16 cents. If your employer is not paying you the national minimum wage, please contact a labor inspector at a labor center near you. The Department of Employment and Labor, working for you. Hashtag SFM Talking Point. Church plays a very important role in society, in nation building. Uh, because uh, you're talking about broken families, broken souls, and the reconstruction and development program of the soul is really here in the church. The ANC has prioritized and made it a point that uh, uh, the ANC uh, as an organization, as a party at the leadership level, you've got chaplaincy which then uh, is a source of this RTP of the soul. Because leaders, too, can make mistakes. And uh, the place of worship, the place of counseling, it is in the church. All right, I'm going to kick it off on the open line this morning in KZN. Milazi, good morning. Good morning, Kathy. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I'm sure you spent your Easter holidays wisely. <laughs> well, we can only hope so, Milazi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, I think something went wrong with the with the network on on Thursday. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was talking of the BEE preferential procurement. Okay. That uh, yeah, that it's not uh, the companies in the private sector. The bosses are manipulating it and still discriminate, discriminating the black Africans. Now, I was asking if you could call one of the auditors who audit the companies for the BEE points to come and explain that have they not picked up that the black Africans are still discriminated from being given work in the private in the private sector because I've I've actually experienced it. I was a contractor in a, in a company, but I was I was given less work. In the end, they actually chased me out of the premises and mm-hmm. I had to go. But the other like uh, Indians. But 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 why were you chased out of the premises, Milazi? Uh, what happened was because I was not getting enough work, so I kept on complaining because my Indian contractors and colored contractors were getting all the work they wanted. 
and I was the only African contract, the black African contract on site. So I kept on complaining because I was actually working for the company, and then I had to resign to to contract mm. because of the of the new opportunities. So because I because I was complaining, and I went to the procurement managers, they were not attending to me. Then a one of the months I saw a a booklet, a newsletter that is actually scored a lot of points on BEE that they are giving out work to the previously disadvantaged group. So I was shocked. I said, how does it happen? I couldn't understand it. But anyway, one of my friends in the manager, uh, one of my African friends in the managers explained to me that, no, it doesn't work like you are thinking. The previously disadvantaged group is comprised of of course, Africans, black Africans, Indians, uh, colors, and the white ladies. So as long as they are giving work to the colors, Indians, and white ladies, even if they cannot give you work, mm. they will still score. Because when the, audit, the auditors come, they'll ask them, how much work have you given out? to the previously disadvantaged group. So, so, then, so, so Milazi, effectively what, what you're saying is that uh, you believe then that, that companies will hide behind uh, some of the detail because the disclosure doesn't push them to actually say, um, we gave this much business to, let's say, a, a black entities, Indian entities, colored entities. Exactly. Mm. Thank you very much for okay. understanding. Quickly. Okay. All right. Yeah. So okay. I would recommend they call it a scoreboard mm. where they're auditing the companies. That they must include, they mustn't just say how much work they've given to the previously disadvantaged. They must also include how much work you have given to these four groups, if, mm. if they four or five. So the companies need to show that they've given out so much work to Captain Tatiana, they've given so much work to read the, 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 right. the white, the, the Indian and the colored. All right. Milazi, I think what you're saying is is, is pretty clear, but, but also, you know, kudos to you for having had the, uh, the wherewithal to actually stand up at the time. And, and say that something was wrong with, with the picture. Of course, you, you paid a price for that, um, but there are not many people who, when they're getting some work, would speak again.